Welcome to the 2020 Wasco County Candidate Forum. First, I want to say a special thank you. The Dallas Civic Auditorium, Great Scott Productions, and Roger Nichols. Without those partners, we would not have been able to do this for you. This year, as we know, we're doing everything differently. And so we had to think outside the box this year in order to bring you this candidate forum. So with COVID in mind, all of precautions of being socially distanced, masked, and everything, we found a way to do this. So you will see in the following video all of our candidates who are running for the different positions that affect Wasco County. Some of them may be on Zoom and some of them may be in person, but we had a way to bring all of them to you and this was offered to every candidate who was running. So I hope that through this video you will be able to get familiar with your candidates. They are people and citizens who are willing to dedicate their time, their energy, and all of their efforts to serve you. So as you watch this, you're going to see the different positions and a question will be asked and each person will be aired or shown that has the answer to that question. Then the next question will be presented for that specific position. So enjoy, be informed, be educated, and then if you have more questions, the best thing to do is to reach out to your candidate and ask them. Be that citizen who really knows and has the educated vote. I'm Roger Nichols, your moderator for today's event. Because of the COVID virus, we've had to do things a little bit differently this year. Each candidate was filmed separately. We gave them three questions that they knew in advance and two that we're going to ask that will be new to them. We will be editing it so that each candidate will respond in turn to each question. And we hope that you find this informative and helpful in your voting process. So who are you and what position are you running for? I'm Wayne Jacobson and I'm running for the PUD board position for subdivision three. I was chosen in August of 2019 uh, when there was a sudden unexpected uh, vacancy, one of the board members passed away. So they, there were three applicants to fill the spot and PUD gave a very extensive interview with the board members. I was chosen as the best applicant, so I've served for 13 months now. And we just had, is interesting, we just had a private consultant from SDAO, the Special Districts Association of Oregon, do an evaluation of our board. And they evaluated the board process, the board members. Everything came back very, very positive. Their biggest concern was that this year in the election, there's three of the five board members that are up for election. So conceivably, there could be a 60% turnover of the board. And they were really impressed with the efficiency and how the board worked together and got things done. Well, uh, Dan's, uh, Dan Williams, one of our board members, decided not to run this year. But we have a good candidate that's running unopposed for his position, so that's good. Uh, Roger Howe, our president, is running unopposed, and I'm the third one up for election. I do have one person, actually one of the original uh, interviewees, is uh, running for that position as well. And the thing that I would hate to see, there's a lot of time and expense that the PUD has gone through bringing me up to speed with the utility business, because the electric utilities are quite different than other utilities, and it's been a fascinating three years, and I just, I'd hate to see that time and money go to waste. Now, I've served on boards for over 40 years, local boards, statewide boards, and even international boards. So I know how boards work, and I can use that knowledge to help the PUD and get better performance out of them. Um, I moved to the Dalles in 1983, opened a business from scratch, hung on a shingle, and opened the business. And even though many new businesses fail within the first two or three years, 22 years later, I sold the practice to a young local guy who is still running it successfully today and carrying on the legacy that I started of helping the people of the Mid-Columbia hear better. Um, why do I want to be on the board? I'd like to start giving back to the community that's been so good to me. I actually started back in, uh, in the mid-1980s 
when I was asked to join the Wasco County Interpretive Center Task Force, where the federal government had $5 million available for an interpretive center with the National Scenic Area legislation. So I joined the committee and was working on that. And actually in 1986, when the award was made, I was chairman of the committee and instrumental in getting the $5 million that we got to start the Discovery Center. And we raised another $16 million to build the $21 million center. Um, but it was really nice to see that take place because we beat out Hood River and Multnomah County. So little the Dalles came through and Wasco County got it. Now, the biggest need that I see for the PUD and why I want to be on the board, um, I want to maintain continuity on the board. We have a board that works well. It does a good job. If out of five people, if there are one or two contentious people in there, it can really mess up the board's function. So I want to keep the continuity on the board and offer reliable and affordable power for our customer owners. Um, now, the board doesn't manage the PUD. The board just gives guidance and direction. You know, the people that manage it, we've got a great, great uh, general manager um, and great board um, or department heads that do the running. We just give the guidance. Um, you know, we offer the vision and uh, try to keep our rates low. In fact, right now, our rate is 5.49 cents per kilowatt hour. That's the second lowest in the state of Oregon. And it's way below the state average or the national average for monthly utility bills. And I was the one in the spring who made the motion to forego the rate hike, a 3.8% rate hike that was scheduled this spring, I proposed that we backed it up a year because I knew the pandemic would cause all kinds of havoc with our customers. So that was actually backed up until next spring when that rate hike goes into effect. Currently, I'm retired. Um, I'm not on any other boards. I'm not contracting with any other firms that might pose a conflict of interest for the PUD, and I've got the time to devote to the PUD. Um, I was a little surprised that PUD board member, it's more than one meeting a month. In fact, tomorrow night, the first Tuesday of the month, is our board meeting. But in addition to that, there's a couple days worth of meetings in Portland with the other utilities uh, in the Northwest area, and there's one day down in Salem, and being retired, I can go to the daytime meetings and don't have to worry about you know, taking time away from work or can I afford to do that. So my goal is just to give back to the community and keep the continuity that we have on the board and keep the board working well. How would you balance the need to upgrade, modernize, and yet keep the rates low? That's a very good question. In fact, we're going through it right now. Down in Thai Valley, we're replacing a substation that has wooden structures from the 1940s. And you know, we have some poles out there, especially some of the back alley poles that are from the 1960s. So we're working those in with a steady upgrade policy where we have to keep the reliability um, because we do have a very reliable system and also keep the price as low as possible. And the pandemic now has shaken things up a little bit. Um, we're prioritizing what needs to be done and how we can work it in. But definitely things have to be done with some of the older equipment. And we're doing that down in Thai Valley now to get that taken care of. But that's going to be a point that will be in play for quite a while. If you could make one change at the PUD, what would it be? One change at the PUD. I thought you said these were going to be easy questions. <laughs> no, the PUD actually is a very well-run organization. And I really don't see anything that I would change. You know, there are some, some challenges that we've got, one of them being to go underground in the downtown area. You walk down the alleys, you see transformers up here and lines running all over the place. And that's one of the things that we've got on the burner to work on is get underground with that. So in that sense, I would like to see us be able to complete the underground installation of the power in the downtown area and clean up the skylight um, 
a whole lot. But that's something that we are working on and will get done. Who are you and what position are you running for? I'm John Amory and I'm running for Northern Wausau County PUD Board Position 3. My background experience revolve around being a small business owner whose companies have performed consulting services for or in a conjunction with utilities, governments, healthcare, education, and on the telecom side, data centers, ISPs, ILEX, CLEX, and other vertical markets. I have two decades of experience in these markets, and I would like to utilize this experience to improve my community and the membership of Northern Wausau County Public Utility District. Additionally, I serve on the Wasco County Utilities Coordinating Council, where I currently hold the position of Vice President. I've also held a board position with Tule Water District since 2016. In that role, I've served as treasurer for most of my tenure and have been responsible for both developing and administering Tule Water District's annual budget. As a small business owner, I've learned how to search for unique opportunities. As a consultant, I have learned how to understand and to adapt to the needs and requirements of governments, utilities, and large entities. And as a current utility board member, I have learned how to navigate the challenges of aging asset management. I feel the combination of all these skill sets makes me the best candidate to help Northern Wausau County PUD excel in the future. I would encourage everyone to learn more details regarding my background and experience through my website, John Amory for PUD.info. Why do you want to run for this office? I believe that most people who choose to go to local politics choose to do so because they really want to be better helping their community. I'm at a stage in my career where I become acutely aware that I can bring value and I have a strong desire to do so. I know that if I can help the PUD team, and, and when I'm talking about the team, I mean the whole team from staff to management to fellow board members. If I can help the PUD team, PUD team keep our utility rates low, maintain reliable power, and prepare for the challenges of tomorrow, that really what I'm doing is helping my whole community. The impact of utility rate increases upon our community is tremendous, probably much more than most people realize. Consider this. If you increase utility rates by 1%, this means that every rate payer's utility bill goes up 1%, right? So MCMC, their electricity expenses will increase by 1%. City of the Dallas will pay 1% more to keep their water pumps running. Kroger's and Fred Meyer's, they, they will pay 1% more to keep the lights on and the freezers cold. Restaurants, hair salons. Every business will see an increase in electricity expenses of 1%. So as residents, we pay an additional 1% for our own power usage. And additionally, we pay the markup for every item we purchase locally due to those entities' increased expenses. The total impact of a 1% increase is much higher than 1%. Now, to be fair, this doesn't mean I believe I can stop rate increases. Cost of living is continually increasing, but it does mean that I will continually and adamantly search for opportunities to reduce rate increases in the future. This is why I want to run for Northern Wausau County Public Utility District Board of Directors. What is the biggest need that you feel exists in the PUD region and what do you hope to accomplish to bring out the results? I want to be clear that I'm not entering into this race with any single agenda. But as the question specifically highlights, the biggest need I feel exists rather than the biggest need I want to address I want, to, I want to highlight two areas that I would like to focus on. First is year over year budget increases. Last year, it cost X to operate. This year, it costs X plus the cost of living or inflation to operate. If we're simply matching cost of living, then I feel we should only be giving ourselves a C grade. There should be efficiencies we can locate year over year that allow us to beat the cost of living benchmark. So I would like to see administration add this as one of the many metrics they currently track and to really focus on locating improvements and efficiencies that reduce this ratio. 
To some, this might seem trivial, but if you set the expectations with regards to how rate increases will be measured moving forward, then administration and staff now have a fixed target, which simply makes their jobs easier. The second area I would like to focus on is power generation. They, we are benefiting from the foresight of our past leaders who developed the Dowells and McNary fish ladder hydroelectric facilities. These facilities generate power for our PUD and help to keep our rates low. As I drive through the gorge, I see multiple energy generating structures such as wind, solar, and hydro. Where others have generated power from our community and then ship it out for a profit. I would like to see administration spend efforts searching for additional power generation opportunities. Who are you and what office are you running for? My name is Rich Mays and I'm running for mayor for the city of the Dells. I've been serving as a mayor for about a year and nine months and I hope to continue with another two year term. Well, good afternoon, Roger. Good afternoon, constituent citizens of uh, the New Hub Valley Gorge, the Dells, the Dolls, they call it. Um, welcome to the Fast and Furious interview, uh, hosted by the Chamber of Commerce and spearheaded by those in the know. Um, we're going to slow this down just a little bit to try to get into the nitty gritty to keep your attention, maybe give you some things to think about and advice you can take to the bank. Um, it's been asked, who art thou? And um, It's um, high time that the third person in me just give up the hat and get down into the first person. Um, the corporate straw man, DBA, Jason Garrett Gibson is dead. He's a dead man. Uh, he was born, bonded to a birth certificate and branded with time as money. And he found himself to be an artificial corporate subject slave at the age of 22 and decided otherwise. He's the character that appears on the ballot along with his avatar angel ancestor, Bud G. Justice. You've got to have a dimensional double. Everybody should have an agent today. We do a lot of social networking and um, the light line and the internet and the Facebook groups is where it's happening. And if they censor your view and they delete or molest your opinions, then you need to have another character or another angle by which to get it through. Um, because, um, quite frankly, the votes are being swung online through social networks, Facebook, Instagram, and rich media. So yeah, um, the third person, Jason Garrett Gibson, is dead. And he is um, here to uh, invite you to transform out of the um, corporate personum into your true self. Some people know me as uh, J. Bob Handy, Angelo Swift, Garrett Steelhead, a number of fictitious characters because I'm self-employed. And um, to be self-employed today within the corporate structure and authority of the state is to be considered a rogue, maybe even a rebel because we don't want American nationals and free people. We need employees and subject slaves. So the um, topic today is going to be um, rather interesting. And I promise that uh, we'll get around to the nitty gritty details, which you can find online if you're genuinely interested in my background and uh, works and, and the benchmark achievements we've accomplished politically then you can find that through any of the Facebook links, Jason Garrett Gibson. You can go to uh, voter111.org uh, for the statewide voter registration guide. Um, we've got some decent press out there. I'm not too happy, to, uh, too happy with Gorge Community Connection today. Um, but we'll work that out. We're going to get this through. So that being said, Mark Twain is quoted as saying, Politicians are like diapers, and they must be changed often and for the same reason. Um, I want to commend everybody who's running for any kind of office today because it takes courage to get out here 
and to express yourself, especially in the climate that we see our country in today. Um, there's some fine folks that are coming forward, a lot of good ideas, um, certainly uh, qualified in, in so many ways. I think personally, Solia is probably going to steal this one. She's got um, the background and the traction to do so, and people are attracted to that. She is a workaholic. How she's going to find time within a 40-hour work week to raise four kids and be the mayor uh, is going to be rather challenging. We're going to need all the help we can get, every single one of us. So no matter who wins the race, um, the Community Action Vision Council is going to be the result of what comes out of creative politic, and we're not going to... Uh, we're going to have to uh, make a, an exceptional effort uh, to distinguish what we're doing as opposed to what we see in the national uh, state of affairs today. Um, so that being said, sir, um, you can call me Jason or you can call me Bud. It's up to you. All right. Yeah. And thank you for the, the extra time. I am Soleil Kabakov. And I am so proud to be here as a candidate for mayor of the city of the Dalles. Uh, our family moved here 15 years ago looking for a place to raise our children. We have four kids, ages 10 through 17. I work full time at Powder Pure as an account manager. We're a sustainable manufacturing company in the port of the Dalles. I'm also on our school board, director for Zone 5. And I'm a community organizer working toward social, racial, economic, and environmental justice at the grassroots level. Why do you want to run for this position? Well, my wife and I moved here uh, from the Oregon coast about five and a half years ago, and we're going to be here the rest of our lives. I've had a lot of experience with public service, 40 years of public service, 33 years in city government, and 28 as a city manager, and I've even served eight months as an interim county manager. And what I want to do is use my experience um, in public service and in city management to have this city grow and prosper. Again, we're going to be here the rest of our lives, and I want to make the most of it for us and for the community. Well, I'm running for this position because I was inspired uh, by Rich Spirit and the roundtable discussions that I plugged into when I first moved to town. I thought, OK, this is a group of people who um, are listening to each other. There's an open-ended architecture to the meeting. Um, it felt good, and it felt like uh, people were genuinely present and, and respectful of each other. And there was a few meetings that I went to prior to the Small Business Revolution campaign, which came online and came on my radar in November, December. And the creativity that went into that and the outcome that came from that, in my opinion, was one of the most creative campaigns, perhaps in the history of Oregon. And I can say that because I've been involved in politics and campaigns for 30 years. And what came out of it was a lot of creativity and some really good ideas, but more so um, an awareness that we are not living in an isolation or a bubble when it comes to our success or our quality of life. We appealed to the world at large. And one of the things that I encouraged my friends and my colleagues and, and comrades to do was to really get into their Facebook and their social networking and reach out. Um, we've used a form called the Planet Art Network since the 80s, um, which was gifted to us by doctors Jose and Luis Dean Arguez. And so we appealed to the Planet Art Network. And the Planet Art Network did a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the work for us in sharing links and, and forwarding links and, and pasting things to different groups and boards. And um, we got back up from Australia, Europe, South America, Mexico, um, Greenland. We saw traffic from uh, places that you would never imagine would have an interest in the dolls. But to put a tagline out there like that during the impeachment of our president, which was very depressing, and to give us an alternative by which to redirect our creativity. Um, what we found is an alternative to the status quo, which could end up transforming the status quo in itself, because Washington, DC, has a very keen interest on in what's happening in the gorge. And whatever happens in this gorge 
is what's going to set the tone not only for the state of Oregon and Washington, but for the nation at large. I really have service at heart. I spend a lot of my time working for justice, uh, as I mentioned, and I would love to take that energy and that drive and put it into our city. I feel like um, we have so much we can do here, and we just need a little more energy to get some momentum behind projects to really uh, bring them to a close and, and achieve some goals here in the city. What's the biggest need you feel exists in your office? I think the biggest need we have is uh, revolves around uh, downtown redevelopment. Um, I think we were uh, certainly on the road to maybe not solving the problem, but uh, certainly helping the issue and when before the COVID crisis hit. But it's hit everybody, so we have to make the best of what we have. But before that happened, and even continuing in the months um, that have happened since March, uh, we have instituted art into the downtown. We've instituted mural, new murals. Uh, we've, ha we've also are going to be having a wall dogs event in about a year. And I think all that is going to add to the ambiance of the downtown and help fill up some of the empty buildings. Um, as I said, I think COVID kind of set us back, but um, it slowed us down, but we have not quit. Uh, the committees I've been working with are still working with other aspects of the community to make this thing a reality with the art and with the beautification. Uh, but I also think that we also need to have a downtown people plaza. And we've been looking at the corner of 2nd Street and Federal Street to make that happen, a, p a place where people can collect. And I also am looking at uh, trying to get some kind of pocket park uh, that takes up maybe one lot downtown for the same kind of a purpose, uh, separate and distinct from this downtown people plaza that I just mentioned. Um, I also would like to see bulb outs installed where um, that, that would come out perpendicular to the, uh, to the sidewalk. And n not only would that add some landscaping and some beautification to the downtown, I also think it would also um, slow down the traffic, which I think is badly needed. I think the Tony's building is going to be a big key to all these efforts. I would like to see uh, a, a reconsideration of downtown housing in that location. And with the possibility of uh, putting retail on the bottom and housing on top, which we envisioned uh, months ago, even before I was mayor. For a variety of reasons, that's all fallen through. But I think the Tony's building is going to be a very key part of what I would hope to accomplish downtown between the housing, the, the, the additional retail, and if that doesn't work out, extending that plaza to the east and making it even bigger. Um, I think all these things that uh, I've been mentioning are going to do nothing but enhance property values. And hopefully, uh, Urban Renewal, who we, works with the city obviously very closely in this, uh, will go along with some of these ideas and make these all a reality. Well, needs and th needs, they're all related. And there's a lot of needs. Um, when I say uh, there's a, a lot, uh, th needs and needs are related to, um, uh, to me, like a, a desperate, um, um, a desperate, a desperate state where um, we need to take care of ourselves, we need to live, we need to work, we need relations, we need to be well, we need to be happy. So, um, of course, if you you know, and everybody wants to be happy, but unless you're healthy, how can you be happy? Under COVID, we've realized we're a very sick nation, we're a very sick planet. And COVID is just the tip of the iceberg, and now it's all coming to the surface. And so we're now we're stopping the world, and we have this opportunity to participate in the greatest reboot in the history of civilization. That's exciting. Anybody who's awake and aware of what's happening today is, of, uh, uh, is participating not only in the supreme good fortune of redirecting the evolutionary trajectory of our planet, but in the overhaul of civilization and perhaps um, the catalyst to a first world peace. Um, the greatest need is vision. I'm running not because I am qualified as mayor. Rich has got all that experience. soleil has got a lot more experience than I do. I need them like they need me. We need each other. Anybody who's willing to participate in government 
is a player. Anybody who, can, who wants to speak up and get out and do something is, is somebody that's, that's welcome to what's going on here. Um, the greatest need is to um, not only know yourself and respect yourself enough to respect others, but to utilize the skills, resources, and the collective will to accomplish what seems to be the impossible. I keep uh, putting it out there to friends and family, you know, if we, if we just learned how to, how to communicate as adults and not have the fear, we're, we're all shackled in fear and we have a fear culture and um, if we could just disarm each other long enough and, and learn who we're talking to and, and learn about who they are and what they do, we wouldn't have to work so hard. We could network the, the resources and, and that's how I've made my living is networking with others and finding out what's going on and what needs to happen and then filling the slot. I'm running for this position because I want to draw attention to the Rorich Peace Pact, the 13 Moon Natural Law Peace Initiative, and the Banner of Peace. Because anything that we do that is not, aware, that, that is not related to harmony and peace with the natural order is simply going to be another facade. It's going to be another uh, band-aid. All of the rhetoric we hear in politics today is sab saber-rattling, um, the battle for the spirit of the nation. It, it's all rooted in war rhetoric. There isn't even a hint that any of our elected officials, whether they be state, local, or municipal, or, or, or national, have even an inclination that there's a peace plan on the table. It's been on the table for 85 years. It's been fermenting for 85 years. There is a mental block, a memory amnesia that prevents the humans from waking up into the, the moment and realizing that everything we've got came before. Whatever gifts, talents, whatever resources, whatever privileges, whatever goodness that we're enjoying, somebody else worked for, somebody else paid for, somebody else died for that. And our forefathers died for these freedoms and died to bring about a more perfect union. That's what's in the treaty. But how many people have even read their treaty? How many people even know what's in the Constitution? I'm hot about the peace plan because what's coming is it's already been laid out for the last two years if you've been paying attention. We're not going to lose our audience with the detail on what's coming. But what's coming has been, has been orchestrated by the higher-ups for some time now. And it's going to require that we uh, really get localized in our authority to create a, an alternative to the confusion that's going to follow with the COVID um, crises. And it doesn't have to be that way if we, can, if we can head it off at the pass, get into this idea that where there's peace, there's culture, and where there's culture, there's peace, and not have to be policed or police because we're living in a criminal economy or a war zone of a mental state of fear, then we have a chance in doing something that's real and that could have a profound impact and could um, redirect the, the tide and, and, and the, the trends that, um, that should have everybody uh, on the edge of their chair. Well, broadly speaking, poverty, so that includes um, a number of issues that are more specific, like housing, affordable housing, also, good living wage jobs, uh, we're short on those, and our schools are in disrepair. So I think poverty would be the broad issue, which is so complicated, um, but it definitely is hitting on some major things here in the Dallas that we really need to push forward to, to progress for our city. If you could change one thing about the city council, what would it be? I'm not sure that, um, I think we've made a lot of inroads to making things more civil. We're all getting along much better than before. Um, 
I really think I'm very proud of the fact that uh, we've been able to get along as people as, and, and not argue in public as much as what's happened in the past. Um, I'm not sure I would change anything. I'm very happy with the relationships that have been developed and I'm very happy with the way that we try to solve problems. We always don't, we obviously don't vote five to nothing on every matter, but um, I think that we've been able to uh, solve our differences in a civil manner. And I'm not, um, I hate to evade the question, but I honestly feel, I feel very good about where the city council is as far as interpersonal relationships go and how we solve problems together. And working with the staff is the other part of this that's very key. Of course, with a, uh, an election coming up, that all could change. Uh, but if I'm reelected, no matter who's on the city council, I'm gonna work just as hard as I did before trying to make those things happen with working together. And in my experience in public service, I've always found that how you feel about the issues is less important than working as a team and respecting each other's opinion. I've, I'm a firm believer in that. And I think that despite the disparate backgrounds and the disparate attitudes and differences of opinion that we've been able to do that. And you can be the most liberal Democrat, the most conservative Republican. You can disagree on a lot of issues, but if you all have what's, you know, work as a team and have what's really important in mind, which is the best long-term interest of the city of the Dallas, I think we can conquer the world. Ah, I was hoping you asked that question. I am, uh, I am not happy with city council and the way they've handled COVID. In fact, I'm not happy with the outcome of the small business revolution. I'm not happy with the fact that Don and, and and uh, the Main Street crew uh, jacked our, alter our, our opportunity to take the small business revolution and really do something with that. They, they, we missed the mark on that. And Rich is uh, a great facilitator. He knows how to ho hold a meeting. Uh, he's a good guy. He's got a lot of background experience, but he's not tech savvy. He is unwilling to work with us in bringing communication utilities to the city. Um, we offered him an entire team of Metro Media specialists who worked with the city of Gresham and were fresh out of the shoot in March, creating programs and opportunities for small business and family and for the community at large to essentially offset the inconvenience and the, and the traumas of COVID and, 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 and the setbacks and replace that um, with alternatives. And we asked Rich and we asked City Council if they'd be willing to work with us in bringing those utilities and, and creating communication networks that would draw people into group discussion and draw people into group collaborative efforts. But we found no, uh, there was nobody, who, we found a resistance. And it's troublesome to, and recently, Rich has taken responsibility for the 500 grand that the, that the um, city has released in COVID relief. I challenged the city. Okay. On August 28th, I challenged the city with a lawsuit. Two days later, they came up with the COVID resources. Hood River's had their resources since June, July. Gresham has had theirs since March, April. We're just now getting into it in September, and it's because one of your local uh, constituent citizens had to strong arm the city in challenging them with where's the money. You know, while most of government is employed or working from home at full salary, we're stretching every dollar and dime thin, and there's a bottleneck in the resources, folks. So in wrapping that up, yeah, um, what, what's frustrating about the city council is that there, need, there is a new, there, there is a working model that could be incorporated into the way that we administrate resources. And we'd like city council to be open to that. We're just asking for an open opportunity to present something as simple as the 13 moon calendar as a, um, as a social form for integrating groups within um, a, a, a structured kind of format that gives us a new vehicle by which to uh, accomplish what seems to be the impossible. I think that we need to take some concrete steps to make the idea of transparency a reality. 
because it's talked about that we want to be open, inclusive, and transparent, but there is work to be done that actually makes it reality. So for example, when people have their committee meetings and they bring back reports to council, written reports that are made available to the public would be a step in the right direction. Uh, just more ways that we could open the windows and doors so that the idea of transparency is real and also the idea that, that it's inclusive and that we're in including our community. There's work to be done there also to recruit more people in to have more diverse ideas because just like any other movement, we tend to get people who like to volunteer to show up repeatedly and we need them and that's amazing because they're the core. But then we need to actively recruit like more people of color, more youth, for example, so that we're getting a wide variety of ideas. And then um, it's even been proven in the business world that the more diverse group you have, the more success you have. It, you know, so it's, it's pretty clear that, that the idea is is welcomed of transparency and things like diversity and inclusion, and now we need to take some concrete steps to make it real. One of the major problems is homelessness. How would you deal with that? I think we need a three, kind of a three-pronged approach. Um, the first one is the, the short term, we need to get a shelter, and the city has been working on getting a shelter for the homeless. Uh, as we speak, we're working on that. Um, the staff is working very hard on trying to find a location. I think some one has been found, but now it takes, it's, a, it's a, a matter of negotiating with a property owner and trying to make that thing happen. So I think the shelter is one, and working with St. Vincent's to the, with the possibility of relocating the existing shelter and, and um, go in that direction. The second thing we need to do, I think, is lobby the state harder. Um, there's financial and, and social service resources, I think, at the state level that we can uh, try to take advantage of, and to the extent they're not there enough, we should be lobbying the state to provide those kind of services because the problem is statewide. There's no question about that. And I think the state can certainly do a lot more towards helping alleviate the, uh, the, the, the challenges that come with the homeless, drug abuse, mental illness, things like that. Um, the third thing we need to do, and this is something I've kind of laid back on, but I'm going to be more aggressive about it if I'm reelected, and that is there's too much fragmentation of the homeless efforts in this community. You've got individuals going in some direction. You've got groups of other people going off in other directions. Somebody needs to bring everybody together and come up with a cohesive plan so that everybody isn't running off in different directions trying to solve the issue. Everybody is very well-meaning. Everybody wants to do the right thing but there doesn't seem to be any organization, there doesn't seem to be any co cohesiveness to the effort. And as a leader, you know, sometimes you gotta be aggressive and take charge. Other times maybe you sit back and you participate, but you don't get too aggressive with it. Other times a good leader will just get the heck out of the way. Well, my, my feeling is for the year and nine months I've been here, I've been the mayor, I've kind of taken that second approach and that is kind of laying back and seeing what's happening and learning about the issue, learning about all the different efforts that are happening. And I think it's, it's time for someone in my position, and I can't think of a better position to take charge, at least get some people, get organized, and start getting less fragmented and more, more uh, unified in our efforts to solve that problem. Nobody knows about the homelessness issue like I do. I'm a, a, a vagabond uh, entrepreneur of a profit. I've lived here in the Gorge for 33 years. After my divorce in 2000, I uh, bought a van and I've lived all throughout the gorge. I've had um, most of my, I usually live one year domestic and one year travel. Um, I've been reading the feedback from the other candidates about homelessness. Unless you've lived it, unless you know uh, how to live without money and live with less, then you really don't know what you're talking about. Um, the homelessness issue is going to be the, probably the hottest topic considering the fires and the bioregional um, crisis that we are in. And in terms of transitional housing and in adapting new ways to, uh, to live well, um, we're going to need to draw upon organizations that have already established that. And again, it goes back to not recreating the wheel. In Portland, we developed City Repair. City Repair is a, 
a network of artists and professionals who create um, social mandalas uh, like the murals we have here, uh, painting four-way stops with large um, mandala type um, images, building um, uh, cob structures, um, hosting uh, natural time retreats where people can unwind and learn something new, maybe just unwind long enough to appreciate what is, um, being re-naturalized into, um, uh, into nature is something that um, we could all benefit from. And so the, the homelessness issue, um, eco-housing, eco eco-friendly housing, tiny housing, um, we need a little RV village kind of thing. We called it Omelands. We went uh, to the National Rainbow Gathering in 96 and we were dialoguing about this in the 90s. Um, there's an entire uh, uh, game plan on the table that was uh, placed on the map out of the gorge in 2006 by Arlo Guthrie. Arlo Guthrie was Woody Guthrie's son Woody Guthrie was commissioned to write songs on behalf of the North Bonneville Project. Arlo wrote Alice's Restaurant. And Arlo chose us, the Blakely family, Montreville Blakely and his collective, to track 13 tunes to, um, uh, to offer Sting, Bon Jovi, Natalie Merchant, and Clapton, and John Mellencamp, who all work together on a project called Give Us Your Poor, which is a project that's intended to equalize um, the, uh, the fallout related to homelessness and to prepare kids before they graduate, not just kids either, but um, to prepare people to, uh, w when graduating or if they're in college, to avoid homelessness by understanding uh, what's available out there in terms of services and how a person can rewild themselves and live with less. And one of the facets that came out of this outreach education campaign was not only a movie and a tour, but uh, we chose some vagabond artists who traveled the world for a year on $10,000. And what they did was is they traveled and they worked and they worked and they traveled. And then after about a year, two years, they came back home and they put everything they had back into a collage. Of course, they kept a Facebook. And then they took their collage and they made a multimedia presentation out of it. And now they're touring, rewilding as vagabond prophets. And they get work at libraries and at schools, basically sharing with people how they can live a good life with less, be happy, and pursue their art and their passion. And um, I think that's what's uh, lacking is that the more you redirect into the aesthetic beauty within yourself and begin to express that in some form of art or some form of service, then you're going to find um, different ideals to work towards and you won't have to have the high overhead. Um, but yeah, in terms of the homelessness issue, um, that's an important one and it's going to become increasingly more so when you consider the fact that a third of the nation is probably on the move. and. Uh, we certainly don't want them setting up camp in our backyards. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. I actu actually reached out to uh, City Councilor Darcy Long Curtis and Sarah Kellams, who's the Executive Director of Hood River uh, Homeless Shelter. And they are working on a wonderful plan for an immediate uh, homeless shelter, like pop-up style shelter, to get people off the street by the time the cold weather hits. Um, they've coordinated with MACAC to get some funding for some pop-up shelters. Um, next steps there are finding a location where they can be and coordinating some transportation for folks so that they can be there overnight and still get down to St. Vincent for meals and showers and things. So there are already some things in the works that um, now that I've discovered the work is happening, I jumped in and offered to help. Um, that would be a short-term fix. Um, you know, we need to look at longer term solutions also that are a little harder to tackle. Um, but I felt so positive and inspired to find that the work was already underway. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to, at least for the short term, get people off the street so that they can be um, safer and have a more cleanly environment and, 
and then have a better chance to re-enter the workforce and things like that. Who are you and what office are you running for? Uh, my name is Darcy Long Curtis, and I'm running for re-election to the Dallas City Council Position 2. I'm Dr. John Willer, and I'm running for City Council Position 2. Why do you want to run for this position? Uh, the reason I want to run for this position is I have enjoyed serving the last four years, uh, making decisions on City Council, representing the people of the Dalles, and working toward a better future. I wanted to run for this position because I've been a uh, the resident of the Gorge for the last 19, almost 20 years. I've run a couple successful businesses, employed a lot of people, and I feel like it's time for me to give back. And if my um, skills and experience are useful to the city, then I'd like to do that. What's the biggest need you feel exists in your office? So that's interesting. That's a question that I've been asked in a number of different ways over the last couple of weeks. And I think that what I've decided is that there are a number of specific issues, but really it comes down to the fact that I, I feel that the need is we need to stop treading water and we need to be more proactive on the things that we are doing for our town. And so it's more of a big picture solution than a specific answer, but I just feel um, that we really have been reactive and I would like to see us more proactive. So the biggest thing about uh, the city, the biggest problem the city has right now is the downtown. That's the heart of the city. That's what makes us unique. And there's a lot of vacant properties downtown and businesses have uh, been leaving. Um, it was already on a downslope before COVID hit, but COVID didn't do anybody any favors for that. So we need to bring businesses back uh, to downtown. And how I do that is we work with um, um, urban renewal, um, Blue Zones, Main Street, the city, the chamber, all those uh, working together. And if we had a um, business recruiting consultant that would coordinate all of that, I think we could make that happen. If you could change one thing about the city council, what would it be? If I could, if I could change one thing, it would be to have more work sessions. Because right now, I feel like um, because we can't have serial meetings, so we have to be very careful not to ever have more than uh, three of us talking at one time, and even that's a little bit dangerous, potentially. And so work sessions are great because the public can come and listen and even potentially participate in whatever topic we're talking about. And it just gives us a chance when we're not actually trying to make decisions to just have a full dialogue about what each of us thinks on an issue. So many times when you come to a council meeting, you've already read your pack it and maybe ask some questions of staff and you, by necessity, you already have to kind of make a decision or at least be most of the way there. You can't just decide like that on some, these are big issues. And so that is a little bit of a disservice to the public when you have to kind of come prepared already and you don't have a chance to really talk about it because it's a nonpartisan position and we should be listening to what other people have to say before we make up our mind. I don't think I'd change anything on the city council. I don't see that there's a problem. I think the trajectory is good and, and uh, reasonable. Um, so I don't see the need to change anything there. One of the major problems is homelessness. How would you deal with that? Yeah, <clears throat> so for the last year, I've been pretty well uh, immersed in that issue. And what I've decided um, is that it's really not just one issue of homelessness. It's actually a bunch of different sub-issues that really need addressed. And I don't think that we have served the neighbors in that area or the people who are homeless themselves. Um, during the time of the pandemic, I uh, had the opportunity to spend a lot of time out at the Shiloh working with people one-on-one -on -one while they were out there. And I decided to take more of a starfish approach, if you will, you know, the story where they're walking along the beach and there are all these starfish dying on the beach and someone's picking up one and throwing it back in and then walking along and then picking up another one and throwing it back in. And someone says, well, that's not very efficient. Like you're, you're not, you can't save them all. And the person says, well, I saved that one. And that's how I see it here in the Dallas. We have such a small community and a number of people who grew up here and are now homeless here. I think we need to be focusing on helping them 
but also protecting the neighbors and the businesses around there. And I see it, um, even though St. Vincent de Paul has done a great job of uh, providing the services that they do, I don't think it's their responsibility. I think it is the city governments and the county government's responsibility, and they can be partners with our community partners, but it is not anybody's responsibility but the city and the county. So uh, that's a popular question. Um, I have noticed an uptick in homeless uh, people, or should I say people who I assume are homeless based on their appearance and their behaviors. Um, and I've given this a fair amount of thought, and I think that there's enough community support that we could get a volunteer group together to go out uh, to the homeless people, identify them, identify their needs, and then couple those, uh, those needs and the needy people with the resources that are already available. There's a lot of resources for homeless people out there right now. They just don't know how to get them. Who are you and what office are you running for? My name is Forrest John Ercole. I was born and raised in San Diego. I re relocated from Humboldt State University where I met my wife. Uh, we relocated here back to her hometown, the Dalles, and we bought her childhood home. Um, I work remotely now for the company that I used to work for in California as a paralegal, and I brew beer at home, I make meat at home, and all the while I have my three-legged dog Astrid to keep me company, and I'm running for the Dallas City Council position number four. My name is John Grant. I'm running for City Council position number four uh, here in the Dallas, Oregon. Hi, Roger. I'm Dan Richardson. I'm running for the Dallas City Council for seat four. The Dallas is my hometown. You know, I grew up here. I graduated from high school in 1991. I worked summers in the orchards. And after a period of schooling and some work, my wife and I moved back. And now we're raising our family here. And um, four generations of the Richardsons call the Dallas home, including our daughter, who's now in high school. I'm First career, I spent about 10 years as a newspaper writer and editor. A couple of years off to be a, a dad, full-time dad. So my wife was finishing schooling. And then I took some uh, graduate courses in science and, and changed directions. And now I work at a soil and water conservation district across the river. And I work with small landowners on natural resource management. So things like reducing wildfire hazard to rural homes, uh, small or non-commercial woodland management, uh, stream ecology uh, in salmon bearing streams and habitat and a variety of other areas of work uh, kind of along those lines. Why do you want to run for this position? You know, uh, I wanna work for my community to better our city. After living in the Dallas for two years, I'm now motivated enough to serve and I'm committed, I'm committed to listening and facilitating connections to keep the Dallas moving forward. And I'd like to make the most of my opportunity while working within the constraints of the law, being honest and open with my opinion. I want to run for this position to be able to give the city of the Dallas uh, an option. Um, I feel like I have a pretty diverse background. Um, I am a U.S. Navy veteran. I'm 32 years old, and I've been here in the Dallas for about nine years. Um, I'm also uh, half Native Native American, um, so I think that just uh, from my upbringing and um, my experience, I think that gives it uh, gives myself a lot of diversity. Well, uh, the short answer is uh, I am looking for a way to be of service to my town. I would really like to have a way to make a meaningful contribution to the Dells. As, as I said, it's my hometown. I love this community. And I've done volunteer um, jobs or bits here and there, served on a couple of boards. Most recently, the uh, City of the Dells Budget Committee. So it's been a couple of um, sessions doing that. And that's sort of, uh, it's almost a dry run at being a city councilor. We work with the council and the budget and the senior staff to go over what's sort of the council's probably most important single job in a given year, which is reviewing and approving the budget. 
And uh, that gave me a sense that um, that combined with sort of my background in covering local government and writing about and talking with um, different local uh, government people and, and problems and projects over the years, that I would have a pretty good base of experience to be effective. So I think that if the voters trust me with this position, that I would be good at the job. And it is a job. It's a service job. It's a volunteer job. And it's meaningful because it is an act of service. So I would be good at it. I think I would be effective. I think the voters would get uh, a, a city councilor who has a heart for the town and, and would approach it with a heart of service and integrity. And it would be rewarding to me. What's the biggest need you feel exists in your office? Uh, the biggest problem in our city is, in my opinion, affordable housing. Um, we have an affordable housing issue and we need to resolve it so that low income families and individuals, our native populace and our homeless populace have a place to sleep at night. Our community as a whole would benefit from having affordable housing by increased spending power, increased hiring and increased in local taxes. Uh, there's a couple of programs that are already working on things like this, like Habitat for Humanity is building homes locally, and we need to continue to support programs such as this. Oregon Housing and Urban Development, uh, they do Section 8 housing. That's really big, and we need to look into grants to assist uh, giving our citizens a home and a place to sleep at night. Um, the biggest need, I think, is it goes to any small town. Uh, I think that we need to be able to recover from COVID-19. Um, I feel like we need to fill our, our down, downtown uh, storefronts, and I think that we need to make sure that we take care of our small business uh, as best as we possibly can. Um, I also think that collectively we need to try to bring our community together. Uh, I think that we've done a pretty good job bringing everybody together over the last few years. Um, and I think that we can continue building that, that uh, sense of community. Uh, I've been thinking about that. It's a tough question. It's a good question um, because, of course, the city council has to keep its eyes on a number of issues. Um, the housing and growth and downtown vitality and finding some sort of um, path to uh, the pandemic recovery and all these things. So it's sort of like, which ball do you drop when you're juggling? Well, none of them. But out of respect, uh, and if you're going to pin me down and say one, I would say, well, the more I talk with people in this campaign and, and sort of try and get a broader perspective and background uh, in city issues, the more I'm starting to think that the one thing that city council could really do maybe in this next year is help the Dells get a sense of itself. Where are we as a community? What are we about? Where are we going? The, sit, the council could do that by holding a kind of conversation with the community, inviting the public and bringing in stakeholders from a sort of a broad uh, group of backgrounds and really trying to get at those questions. What are we about? What are our priorities? So I guess I'm, I'm saying crafting a vision, something that we could uh, understand and hold to in common it would provide us a sort of compass or a true north to steer by for all these other big questions. And we have a number of those facing us. But a compass gives us a, a way to frame these other issues and a sense of how to prioritize them. And if we have that, then we could help ourselves by sort of guiding our own destiny rather than just being hit by this issue or that issue. So I think that's one thing the city council would, could do that would be of real service. And if I'm elected, that's uh, one really um, central idea that I'm going to take seriously in the first year. If you could change one thing about the city council, what would it be? If I can change one thing about the city council, it's membership. Just give it a shake up. Uh, this town needs a new breath of life, and I think the best way to do that is just through new council members all around. Uh, I'm not saying anyone's done anything wrong. I support our council and our city, what we've done, 
I just feel, you know, it's time for some new blood. Let's give it a new outlook in life. Let's help the Dells grow. I, I don't think that there's any one thing that I have in particular that I would say that needs to be changed. I think that any city council, um, any city council needs to be able to work together collectively. I think that you need to have uh, a vision. I think everybody needs to put it, have input, and I think that they need to get to be able to get along together very well to be able to conduct business and push the city forward. I feel a little uh, unready to answer that question because I haven't served on council. Uh, that said, we have five city council members. A recent charter change makes all of them at large. I'm not sure how I feel about that. There are distinct areas in the Dalles. And if all of the councilors are at large, there's a real hazard that big areas of town, big constituencies, you might say, of people, might get left out of the conversation. So for instance, I grew up kind of in the middle of town. And now I live on the east end of town. And I don't have a lot of strong connections necessarily to the west end. And while I would have, if elected, I would have sort of the global view, I have a heart for the whole community, I might not have an understanding of issues that affect the West End folks as well as somebody who's from there. So that's something I would really want to look at is uh, whether our recent charter change, putting all the counselors at large, serves us well or whether we need to maybe have a course correction in a few years and go to specific districts maybe say four counselors of specific districts and one at large. One of the major problems is homelessness. How would you deal with that? That ties in part with my affordable housing. Um, once we have affordable housing, some of those low income people that possibly don't have a place to stay will have an opportunity to get a home. Uh, I would like also to see a homeless assistance center where homeless individuals uh, could possibly go uh, use a bathroom that's open 24 seven, possibly a shower, uh, bike repair, uh, availability to get bike lights for their bicycles so that they could be seen at night. Um, and support local programs that we have uh, in our town already that help uh, the homeless. I believe it's the Mid Columbia Assistance. I'm not sure on their name, but uh, there are some programs that already exist that we just need to further support to help our homeless community. Um, the homelessness, I, I think that, I mean, that, that is a huge, <laughs> uh, huge problem. And I definitely, that's not just in our, our city, our area. Um, I don't think that that's specifically just a question of homelessness. I think that there are underlying issues with that, that I think that our community can try to address. And I think that we need to do whatever, do what we can to help it out, but I don't think that there is an ultimate solution because I think that would pretty much solve most of the United States' issues you know, throughout all the different cities as well. Um, but I think, that, um, I think that we can always strive to be better when it comes to helping out our homeless population. Well, that's a, that's a tough question because it's sort of multifaceted there is more than one flavor of homelessness, of course. And I want to say, when we're talking about homelessness, we're not talking about an issue. You know, we're talking about people. We're talking about our neighbors who are struggling to keep a roof over their head, or people who have landed here, however, and maybe um, suffering or dealing with issues that most of us just don't really have a sense of. So there's different flavors of homeless people that we need to serve and respond to. And I don't have sort of a, a single answer for that. It's a multifaceted question. And in fact, I would say, uh, I wouldn't trust a candidate who came here and said, I've got the answer. I've got all the answers on this. Um, I sure don't. I'm at the, at the start of a, a sort of steep learning curve on this particular issue. I think one thing the city council could do, and that's really what we're talking about, is not the, the city council could convene um, 
a conversation, maybe an ad hoc work group, an ad hoc committee that had a, a, a set period of work, maybe a year, to help set out the issues, the metrics that we actually have, the scope of the issue um, that the city could grapple with, and come up with a couple of actionable steps. So we know that, for instance, or at least I would think that we need to find a new home for the warming shelter. Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's an obvious need. And there's going to be a need um, because uh, uh, some of the folks that have a real heart for this issue have won an award or a grant to put up temporary housing. So we know that there are things in play. How those all work together is something I'm still trying to get a hold of. But it's something the city council should really lead on because there are different agencies, different needs, different people, as I say, different flavors or, or kinds of homelessness, and no one's sort of having the overarching uh, authority or presence. But the council could do that, could lead, convene, find sort of a, a coherent and transparent plan to help. So I would say that's really what we need is this multifaceted plan and some leadership from the council to get there. Who are you and what office are you running for? Thank you, Roger. My name is Rod Runyon and I live in the Dells. I grew up in the Dells, went to high school right here in the Dells and raised my family here. I moved away a couple of times, but always came back and, uh, you know, it's just uh, good to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Tiffany Prince and I am running for city council position for City of the Dells number five. Why do you want to run for this position? You know, kind of goes without saying that bringing value to the table has always been my goal. My various roles in government oversight, developing and monitoring contracts, fielding citizen issues, uh, moder moderating conflicts to resolution along with the government budget process, asking hard questions, an old talk show host you're familiar with, uh, both sides of, working both sides of the table on, on that aspect. And, mm -hmm. Public service gives you an opportunity to do that. I've been elected to a cross-section of leadership roles in my community, and currently I am the incumbent, uh, the Dallas City Councilor at large, which is a two-year term, and that's coming to an end here mm -hmm. in a couple of months. And the, uh, that will go from being the at-large position to being position five, and that'll be a four-year term, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, in addition to that, uh, I was eight years as Wasco County Commissioner, four as the chair, uh, one year as treasurer of, uh, treasurer of the Association of Oregon Counties and on the executive board, and eight years elected as Port of the Dells Industrial Development Commissioner, and uh, way back in the 80s, uh, four years as a city planning commissioner. So I think I've got all the bases covered to be that guy on the council that can look objectively at, at, at an issue mm -hmm. and try to come up with a reasonable approach. The difference of being on city council as opposed to county commission, I only had to convince two other people. <laughs> you know, on the city council, what people will discover who hold this position as they go down through uh, the years is that you've got to convince not only you know, four other councilors, but you've also got the mayor in there who's working his own path. And so it's, it's a little different than, uh, well, actually a lot different mm -hmm. than being with the county. In addition, uh, you know, I've been elected uh, in my elected positions over the years. I've had state appointments to regional solutions under uh, two different governors, uh, appointed three times. I've uh, been a member of and chaired a number of regional and bi-state committees, including those on transportation and rural internet connectivity economic development districts, uh, housing councils, low-income community action, public safety coordinating council that works with law enforcement in the Dallas, mm -hmm. and I'm currently on that representing the city. I was on it representing the county previously, so I had a, a record with those folks. And I was also the uh, board member and, and chair of uh, NORCOR twice during an eight-year period. So now, and since I got onto the city, you know, I'm totally retired. I'll work a part-time thing here and there, but professionally, I was a small business owner. I had a financial services background of 25 years, roughly, 
and about 15 in uh, broadcasting radio and TV as a talk show host and operations manager of, of small radio stations with 10 to 15 employees. So I think I've got a lot of well-rounded experience. And why do I want to run for council? I think I bring that experience to the chair. And uh, you know, I look forward to doing it again for the next four years. There's a lot of reasons why I want to run for this position. Mainly the key reason, I would say, is to bring a younger and more diverse voice to city council that represents a lot of generations that aren't currently being represented represented on city council. Um, I'm a female, 34, and there's, I would say, about like three generations that probably aren't being represented or represented at all. Um, and so I want to bring that voice and I want to um, bring that diversity to city council. That would probably be the main reason. Okay. What's the biggest need you feel exists in your office? There are several, and there are Maybe not in any particular order, but maybe they are, especially in light of the, the current uh, situation we're in with the pandemic and all that. Uh, recovering from the coronavirus by rebuilding our local economy, which has suffered greatly, and we're losing businesses. Mm -hmm. We've had several close here just recently. So what I think I can help do is continue to examine local rules, regulations, permitting, zoning, general welfare, lobbying the state where needed to facilitate the process, the process uh, because I can reach out to the contacts I've had around the state. When I, when I call, and it's, it's not an ego thing at all, but I was so involved on the state level, when I do call, they know my name. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really good to get us in the door asking questions of communities that are our size uh, that are having similar problems, you know, and it's very helpful as well as in Salem and, mm -hmm. and talking with officials there. Um, housing needs across the board. Um, we've made great strides, but we've got a lot to do. And it's not all low-income housing. It's uh, inter intermediate housing. It's, it's mm -hmm. across the board. But as we've just seen in a recent uh, situation, we need to look at the safety of our citizens and the proximity of those housings for the type of need they're going to fill. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very important. So, but probably after all of that, the other one I want to keep bringing back up as I drive across some of the interior streets in our community is that we are in desperate need of infrastructure, not only repair, but improvement. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I could trot citizens in here from a lot of streets in this community that would just say, why are we living like this? Why, mm -hmm. why don't we have a, a street that we don't get you know, our teeth uh, knocked out of our face every time we walk across? Mm -hmm. So I want to keep looking into what our plans are going down the road. We are doing some of that. Uh, the Public Works is working on some of those projects. It's expensive. You know, it's time consuming. And then there's other things that always get in the way and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to do more along those lines. And I'd like to see us work on that residential aspect for infrastructure. So kind of what I just shared with wanting to bring another voice or bring a diverse voice to city council, um, I think that that is probably the greatest need when you look at the makeup of city council. I think by bringing in that diverse voice and having that younger generation voice when we're talking and making decisions for the future, um, even for current times, just having like, okay, I'm younger, I know how, like my generations, my friend groups, my coworkers, my peers, you know, a little bit older, a little bit younger than me. I know how they feel. I know how they are thinking, and that's who I talk to. And I think that's a really good need that needs to be filled, so those voices are getting heard. If you could change one thing about the city council, what would it be? You know, the team is is pretty good right now. City government is, is quite a bit different from county government where I served for eight years, and that's taken some adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, your city manager has a lot of control. Uh, we only see you know, just certain things regarding policy mm -hmm. and policy changes, but there's a lot, of, a lot of control in the city manager. So what I would like to see is that each, and, and several of them are doing this now, but I would like to see each one of them take a more active role 
not just at city council meetings, that's fine, what they're doing there is fine, but at other times, being involved, uh, making appointments to sit down with department heads. Um, when I first came on board, another area that, that I was really big on because I'd been involved with the Association of Oregon Counties, there's a, an, a, 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 same, a similar group called the League of Oregon Cities. Mm -hmm. And I went to three of those meetings before I ever took office and found that there, there really wasn't anybody taking part in that. And so mm -hmm. I took the mayor to a meeting in, in Roseburg and, and I took uh, Councillor McLaughlin to a meeting in Salem and uh, showed him around down there in the Capitol and whatnot. I think we need to be involved on that state level, mm -hmm. especially with communities that are in our population area. Uh, there's a real opportunity to share ideas, and like mm -hmm. I say, uh, you know, there's similarities in all communities of the same size population and whatnot mm -hmm. that uh, we're working on to solve. And some are doing a good job of getting problems solved, and others mm -hmm. are lagging behind, et cetera. I think we're above the line. Mm -hmm. I think we do a pretty good job. Uh, a lot of it has to do with money. Um, and, and beyond that, uh, a lot of rules, are they come down from the state. You know, and we have no choice, yep. and that's hard to explain to citizens. So I think getting involved in those organizations like the League of Oregon Cities and the National League of uh, Cities is a, is, a, is a thing I'd like to see more of mm -hmm. in the next four years. Okay. I think that I would like to see more um, respect and open dialogue and conversation. Um, here, you know, each person on city council is there to represent the people that they know, the city of the Dalles, their constituents, um, making sure that their, their voices is heard is important. I used to be the executive assistant to the Board of Education for Columbia Gorge Community College and having some different board chairs throughout the years, you know, and rec recently we've had them where they're making sure that each board members having their voice heard and having that conversation has really been beneficial to the college and getting, you know, being, being heard I think is really important and hearing everyone's concerns or their thoughts, I would really like to see maybe some expansion on that. Does that add to the length of the meeting? Certainly, obviously, you're giving everyone the chance to speak if they wish, but I don't, I don't think that we should be shutting down ideas or people's voices uh, they're elected to sit there. I think that we should be willing to hear them um, and not demean them or, or judge their opinions. One of the major problems is homelessness. How would you deal with that? Well, you know, the Dallas has done a pretty good job of having food sites and other things going on that have attracted some as well, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and the word down the gorges, you know, if they're, if they're leaving Portland, the Dalles has got some amenities to help. But obviously anymore, we don't have enough. And that's the case everywhere in the state. We're not alone out there. And I don't think we're going to find the magic solution. But there is a committee in the city council started by our city manager. It's a small committee that's working and looking at some of those ideas right now. Um, I think my role because of statewide contacts and whatnot, I've got friends in Eugene that have built uh, three different types of communities on land that was donated and so forth. Uh, and I've referred other communities that have called me from my past experiences to those individuals in Lane County. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I can be real helpful that way to put some people together. So I'm, I was on, I was on those, the original committee here in the Dells uh, that Jim Slusher headed up from Community Action because I was chair of Community Action. Mm -hmm. And then when I went on to City Council, I let another City Councilor take that, that spot. Um, so there, there are committees and things going. We just need to get them all working together towards a common goal. But again, it comes down to money, it comes down to land, and trying to figure all that out with all the other issues we have in our community. And, and you know, each group will tell you their particular issue, whether it's economics, business, failing, homelessness, et cetera. Everybody's issue is the number one issue. And the secret is trying to, how, to, how do we advance in these different areas and keep people safe? And thank God, we've got a great police chief and a good police force. And I think they do an incredible job with what they've got. Homelessness in the Dalles, 
That's been an ongoing issue. When I ran for city council two years ago, it was a conversation of topic. I'm by no means an expert when it comes to homelessness. I do understand that this isn't an issue that's gonna be solved overnight. And I think that what I can provide to the conversation or to the topic is the willingness and the openness to learn and hear the conversations and to read the data. Um, it, you know, some people, they're choosing this lifestyle and some people they're not and they're humans and we want to be able to fairly listen to them and not demean them or judge them for whatever their life situation was. And so I think by the best way to tackle that is to begin an open conversation where it's open, it's caring, it's non-judgmental. I think that we can really start moving forward and making some growth or some progress in the best interest of what their needs are. Like, are we, do we even know what their specific needs are sometimes? Um, have we had those conversations? So I think that that initially is, should be a great starting point in bringing forward some forward movement in, in that realm. Who are you and what position are you running for? Roger, thank you. Uh, thank you. For, thank you all for this opportunity. The, my, my name is Cliff Benz, um, spelled B-E-N-T-Z. And um, I, I am uh, running for what we commonly refer to as Greg Walden's job, but that Congress and uh, in Congressional District 2 here in Oregon. And why do you want to run for this? Well, for years, I've uh, hoped to have an opportunity to run for Congress. I never thought I would have this opportunity because uh, Greg was doing a wonderful job. It was a surprise to me when he decided not to run again. And, um, but, but I have spent years uh, reaching uh, out to different parts of CD2, either as a water resource commissioner for eight years or as a a member of the Oregon House for 10 years or as a member of the Oregon Senate for two years. And each, each, each of those jobs, I did the very best I could in those positions, never knowing if I would be able to move on to another job or not. I figured the best thing you can do is a good job in the place in which you find yourself. Uh, and then if an opportunity presents, as this one has, you look, at, you look at it and you say, hey, is there something I can bring to the job? And, and what I bring to the job is a lifetime in, as a lifetime resident of CO, CD2, and in uh, and, um, and a family who lives all across and all over CD2 and, uh, and a, a wealth of experience in, in working with and, and, and meeting people of CD2. And in, in the Dallas area in particular, um, lots of work because of course, Dallas is part of my Senate, Senate district. So I got to know a lot of great people there. What is the biggest need that you feel currently in the district? Well, the district, as you know, it's huge, 69,000 square miles. And so to say one need is greater than the others kind of depends on where you're, where you are in the district. I, I would say though, that one of the common needs right now is to do something about our forests. These fires in the Dalles and Hood River are all too familiar with them. The, the, the horrific buildup of wood and fuel and putting all our cities in danger seems to be a problem all across the district. So uh, what, one of the things I would hope to be able to focus on should I be uh, fortunate enough to be elected and then fortunate enough to be placed on the Natural Resource Committee in DC would be uh, doing something about this terrible buildup of, of fuel. But I, have to, but I have to tell you, Roger, there's so, many, there's so many problems, whether it's water or whether it's transportation or whether it's housing or whether it's healthcare or whether it's recovering from this virus. The, the, the virus recovery problem almost reaches the level of forest, but the truth of it is uh, we need to protect the people in our city. We have to protect them. Uh, and the, the, what's happened down in Medford and over in the Willamette Valley and down in the Klamath and even around you is just wrong. So that's, that's the biggest problem as I see it right now. Okay. How do you deal with a situation where the district has one opinion about a particular issue and you have a different opinion about that issue. Yeah, well, your job is to represent your district. And so you, you check your principles carefully. If your principles are such that you cannot support the district, then you tell the district why you can't. But 
the, your job is to represent people. It's not to go there because of what you want to do. So you, you, you listen and you listen and you listen and you listen. And then if for some reason you, 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 you know, because of maybe information you got in Washington DC or someplace else that the district has it wrong, you still, you still better, you still better do what the district wants. Here's the truth of it. The great quote from uh, somebody that was in Congress is he went back to explain in great detail why he had been so right and he was so smart and everything else. And this person stood up and said, hey, we didn't send you back there to do the smart thing. We sent you that back to do what we want you to do. And, and that's the trick. Your job is to listen and, and, then, and then do your best to, to represent the people that sent you there. Okay. I go back a, a second and you serve so much time in the legislature. Obviously the Oregon Department of Employment failed pretty catastrophically. What should we do about that? Are you talking about their computer system or is yeah, yeah. about? So uh, the, the 12 years I served in Salem, I was never in the majority, not one day. And um, what we ended up doing when, when the Democrats who held every state office for many years until um, the, our secretary of state, Dennis Richardson was elected as one of the few Republicans. Um, what we ended up doing basically was trying to call out problems, whether it was with the DMV computer, because you know we had a huge problem there, Recover Oregon's gotta be the classic wreck. And so those, those, those systems, uh, they're very, very complicated and you have to go into them with an, an incredible amount of help. And uh, for whatever, whatever reason, uh, it's never been done right. And, 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 and but you know what, we had a warning uh, and I'm gonna say we, I'm gonna talk about the majority party who's charged with governing the state had a real wake up call in 08, 09, and 10 when, as you know, unemployment went through the roof. So there's really no excuse for what's happening now. There really isn't uh, when it comes to the computer systems that, that are in this state. Uh, they, and I, I mean about it, but some of these things are so important, you got to get them right. And uh, so I hope they've hired the help that they need to get it fixed and, uh, and to get money to the people who still, I think, I don't know how many are still waiting for their unemployment checks with it. However many it is, it's too many. Who are you and what position are you running for? Well, hello, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I am Alex Spencer, and I am your nominee for the U.S. House of Representatives okay. here in Congressional District 2. So why do you want, why did you want to run for this office? Well, did I even want to run for this office? <laughs> <laughs> That's the bigger question. So I was working with Roz Mason. I was her campaign strategist. And uh, when she decided to withdraw, she suggested I run. And I said no. And she strongly suggested I run. And I said no. <laughs> and then I promised I'd go off and think about it. And I did. And I spoke with people. And I did some soul searching and then in my right mind and shaking all over here I am and it seems to have worked out pretty well so now running for office was was always in the cards I mean I've always I've always thought I was going to run for office I figured it I'd be running for the senate first rather than the house and so um so that's really it's more of a timing difference than anything else and it was good to know good to find that I was ready you know, and, uh, and I love the campaigning. I love the travel. I love all of it. It's just so interesting. And really, I look at this as a very long, very fun, very expensive job interview. So what is, so what is the biggest issue you think facing, facing the district right now? And how do you intend to deal with it? Certainly the very biggest issue facing the district right now is the divisiveness that we find ourselves facing. I, we, we need to be able to speak with our neighbors again. We need to be able to speak with respect and care for each other and really understand each other again. Um, how I deal with that every single day, I, um, all of my, everything that I do is open to both uh, Republicans, Democrats, and of course, libertarians and, and everyone else. It's really important to have an open dialogue, to go before people and be able to uh, speak to each other with respect and with 
dignity and really understand that the issues that we're facing are the same across the board. We need, we all want clean water. We all want clean air. We all want energy that is safe and affordable and something that would keep our earth happy in, into the future. It's really important that we care for everyone. And the very first step in this is changing the way we communicate with each other. I know you're running for Congress, but this may have an effect on it. The uh, Oregon Department of Employment's handling of the situation has been less than stellar. Is there something that Washington could do to help with that? I am sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you say sure. it again? The sure. Oregon Department of yeah, unemployment or employment oh, department. Unemployment. Yeah. Oh, unemployment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a huge issue right now. And one of the things certainly that we can do in a national way is have this next round of support for folks be okay, we need another that that we need more money into the pockets of people, right? We have so many folks that are unemployed and yes, the unemployment system has just been overrun and they're having their own issues with dealing with COVID-19. And I know someone who does this work and they've had to change from, you know, a nine to five job to shift work, right? So that everyone can keep the distancing and everyone, and that of course slows everything down. And it's, it's really a difficult issue. Now, the stimulus checks that we got, the $1,200 for everyone, what I think that needs to happen in this next bill is that for every month that it has taken for the Congress to get together on, um, you know, on a package, for every one of those months, folks need a $1,200 stimulus. And then that needs to continue through the, um, through the foreseeable future until we've got a handle on this because we have folks, not only folks out of work for a good long time, and then folks who've gotten back to work are often getting back in a, um, they're often getting back to work with less hours and less, um, and less money and, I apologize, my phone is, is doing strange things again. So often when people do go back to work, they go back to their jobs and they're making less money or they're, they've got fewer hours. And, and they're still having to work more than one job just to make ends meet. And that's the biggest, the biggest issue that we have. But if we were to have um, stimulus that continues, that really, um, um, supports folks through this very difficult time, then I think that uh, then people can get up off their feet, get back on their feet. The most important thing I want to say is that when, when the moratorium on evictions ends, that we will be faced with the very real problem of people being homeless in numbers that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. Right now, since the wildfire, so many families are homeless already. And so we really need to make sure that people are made whole from the time that they've been unemployed and into the future through this COVID-19 revolution that has been thrust upon us. It's very, very important that we take care of everybody, that we understand where everybody is and that we meet them where they are. And uh, we have to we have to look forward. We can't look back and see how we've always done it. How would you deal with a situation where you have one uh, solution to a problem and the people in the district don't agree? So when when there's a disagreement between what my solution is and what the district would rather have, I think that the district needs to win. I think that what's important 
to understand is that, and, and I know where this, this is coming from, right, is that there is a perception that Congressional District 2 is very, very, very conservative. And while it's true that Mr. Walden has been reelected for the past 21 years, um, incumbents in America win. Okay, it's 86% chance that the incumbent wins. And so the deck is stacked against anyone that runs in an open election against them. So what we're looking at now is the fact that non-affiliated voters outnumber Republican voters in Oregon's Congressional District 2, and Democrats are gaining on Republican voters in Oregon's Congressional District 2. And we're finding that, especially when I'm able to talk to folks, they understand that we're not far apart from each other. We're, we're very, 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 very close. And so there is, there's a lot less divisiveness when people understand what's going on. And so I believe that um, our policies are going to uh, jibe more than more than we think that they will because when we look at the non-affiliated voters we look at folks that are looking for someone who's going to be their voice in congress and so they're looking at me so who are you and what office are you running for my name is joe ray perkins and i'm running for the united states senate okay. why do you want to run for this position it's important that we have a senator who is going to represent all Oregonians and not just part of the state. And it's important that we have a senator who's going to um, honor their oath of office to serve the country, honor and protect the Constitution, and to make sure that they legislate according to the Constitution and what the duty of a U.S. senator is. What do you feel is the biggest need for the state right now and how could you help from, from Washington? The biggest need is reducing regulations that are keeping, reducing federal regulations that are keeping uh, businesses uh, from growing, uh, entrepreneurs from starting businesses, taking a look at all the fires that we've had, over a million acres have burned this year so far and hopefully those are going away here soon, uh, but making sure that we've got the proper forest management so that we're not letting the forest burn and uh, opening up the paths for, for a new industry to come into Oregon that is going to be friendly to Oregonians. And, and let somebody else come in and fix the system. Given the ever-growing national deficit, do we need to spur the economy further with another big uh, stimulus package? The governor needs to open up Oregon. She needs to stop telling uh, different businesses that they can't be open and parts of the state are still in level one uh, or phase one to where they can't even hardly have the doors open. We've um, had thousands of jobs lost here in Oregon. Um, people trying to figure out how they're gonna make ends meet. And the best way to turn that around is to let the state open back up and people need to uh, make sure that they're taking care of themselves, um, practice proper hygiene, washing their hands, using soap and water. If they're sick, stay home. And um, I think that that's, that that's what's really important is letting people get back to work and living their lives, letting the kids get back to school. And I think that's gonna go a long way instead of having the federal government have to come up with more and more money we're already over $27 trillion in debt. And that's a number that we can't even fathom. But to try to put that in perspective, it would take just about 2,000 years to spend $1 trillion if we spent $1 million every single day. And we're over $27 trillion in short-term debt. And we are about $2 trillion in a, uh, uh, annual deficit. We've, we've spent more than what we've brought, than the government's brought in, and again, uh, people aren't working, there's not uh, income tax revenue and other forms of revenue coming in. I'm very hesitant to say that there should be more stimulus money without fully reading the bills inside out and backwards and getting a complete grasp 
on what's going on with all that money. And finally, what do you do in a situation where you have a different opinion from your district on an issue? Well, this is a statewide race. So there's gonna be a lot of areas that I'm not going to be in agreement with my constituents. This is my pledge and my, and my uh, promise that every bill that I vote on is gonna be measured against the, the duty and the responsibility of a US Senator looking at it from the constitutional standpoint of what is the duty of the federal government when it comes to the states. And so for me, it makes it very easy and well, easier to, um, to say, how is this constitutional? Is this a state issue or is it really a federal issue? We're not going to agree on everything out there. We need to focus on what we agree on. And I think that we can work through what we don't agree on. But most people, they, they want their basic needs. They want to love and be loved, have a roof over their heads, feel safe and secure in their homes, be able to provide for their families with food on the table. And they really want the government to stay out of their lives. They just want the government to let them go live their lives. And I think that that's a really important stance that, that we need to take as elected officials. And depending on what level we're at in the government, for me, running for a federal seat, it's making sure that everything that I vote on is absolutely constitutional first. Who are you and what position are you running for? Well, my name is Ibra Teher. Um, I'm just saying it because a lot of people would know, would, uh, would, wouldn't know how to pronounce it. Um, I am a son of immigrants. I was born here in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I've been married uh, from my heavenly wife for 13 years right now. Uh, we have three kids, all sons. Um, I'm also a, a philosopher. I majored in philosophy, I have graduate degree in philosophy, and also an anti-war activist. Okay. Why do you want to run for this position? Well, um, I was interested in running for uh, any federal office, meaning uh, one of the uh, congressional races. Uh, I am uh, in uh, Lane County, Eugene, which is um, the fourth uh, congressional district. So we have Peter DeFazio and we have uh, the other uh, option that I had is uh, the U.S. Senate race. And I evaluated the situation between the two races. And um, specifically, I chose to go to the U.S. Senate race for specifics about uh, Jeff Merkley, the incumbent, that I don't wish to go through them now. OK, thank you. Um, what is the biggest need that you feel the state of Oregon has right now? Well, uh, this is a question that really is not unique to Oregon. Uh, what the country has, I'm running for a federal office. So what is the, uh, the thing that uh, the whole country needs right now? Uh, I can uh, point out to ma two major things that really is uh, very stressful issues and they are not uh, being solved on the contrary. Uh, they are getting worse. One of them is the economy. And when we talk about the economy, we're talking about uh, a collapse economy. Um, if um, a lot of people may not know about this, um, we are heading to 30 trillion in the national debt, which is unprecedented by the end of this year. Uh, we are looking at one, uh, 1 1.3 trillion deficit for the next 10 years. Uh, the economic collapse uh, is going to affect Oregon uh, a lot because Oregon's economy is not really one of the strongest economies. Uh, we have a very centralized economy, and this is true also for Oregon, uh, which is going to be a disaster. We need to have solutions. I think you've seen what, what happened with the uh, COVID the supply chain. Uh, I'm, I'm saying COVID supply chain because of what happened with the measures of COVID, how the supply chain has impacted in a way that uh, we realize now it is dangerous to have centralized economy. These big supply chains, even the food chain has impacted, which means people can go 
uh, uh, and to like weeks without food security, which is expected right now. This is a very dangerous problem. And it is it stems from the economy that we have. Um, fortunately, we can survive here in Oregon. Uh, we have a very green state, uh, but that would be really a struggle for the whole country. So this is the, uh, one of the main issues. The second one, which, which really worries me, is the divisiveness now that we can see it between left and right. It is not hidden uh, that there is a conflict and the leaders of um, both parties, actually, Democrats and Republicans, are telling their constituents to be ready to rise up in November. Uh, I've seen statements from both sides. Uh, we just had shootings. People have been killed here in Oregon, right? Uh, we know that. We've, we've seen that conflict, uh, the, the tension between left and right. And instead of um, invitations to, to be united, we are seeing um, uh, something to the contrary. Um, uh, emo emotional, um, really charging for, for November, which really worries me. Um, I can't really imagine what could happen. So uh, the need for unity, we need uh, the we need we the people realize that uh, we are together in this situation, and we should not be really distracted and confused by the political games. It's all politics. It's nothing about the people, even if they try to convince us that it is about us. You're not running as a Republican or a Democrat. Can you tell us a little bit about your party? Well, I'm running um, on the Green Party ticket. I was also co-nominated by uh, Oregon Progressive Party, which is a third party, a uh, very mi uh, minor party. Uh, the Green Party is really not uh, an invention of the United States. It started in Europe and it came to the United States uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, it has uh, uh, one of the... Um, uh, really biggest proposals about the eco-socialism. I mean, eco, it is correct. You can call it eco-socialism, um, but um, also you can call it ecological wisdom. Uh, anyhow, uh, it was proposed as an economic reform through environmental um, uh, activities, uh, which uh, uh, try to preserve the environment in a way and also uh, sustain the economy uh, in the other way. So this is the Green Party ticket. It uh, invites people for uh, four pillars, actually. Uh, one of them is peace, which is the most uh, important issue that we have in foreign policy which is missing from our, our foreign policy. Um, right now we have 800 military bases around the world. Um, we are engaged in more than 60 countries right now in military operations. Uh, we have um, seven ongoing wars. Uh, our drone strikes um, last year uh, was were about uh, 44,000 uh, bombed. Uh, bombs uh, were dropped uh, on several countries. So even if there's no war is declared, uh, even if there's no declaration of war, but we are bombing different countries. Um, I think to, just two weeks ago, we bombed Iraq. Uh, people don't know that. We are bombing a sovereign country uh, which violates the international law and uh, it is considered a high crime according to our constitution, an impeachable high crime, by the way, uh, according to our constitution, but neither um, Democrat or Republican really look at that uh, article, which is article six of the constitution. So this is peace, one of the pillars of the Green Party. And the other one is, uh, as I said, the ecological wisdom. Uh, which uh, which really um, address the environment. The other one is uh, social justice. Uh, so those are three um, three pillars. Uh, I forgot the other one. So forgive me for that. Anyhow, uh, it is not a mainstream uh, party, which which means it opposes most of what's going on. Uh, 
uh, in terms of um, the corruption that is happening, the money in politics, uh, the election, um, the economic system in a way, uh, it does not invite for socialism. This is not what the um, Green Party in general invites the people for. Uh, but uh, it invites people for um, economic justice, uh, where people are getting equal uh, opportunity to be part of the economy. Speaking of the economy, uh, one of the big questions is whether, given the deep deficit that you mentioned, that we need to spur the economy by further spending on the federal government power. Do we need another big economic stimulus package or not? Well, um, this is a paradox, right? Because we're talking about something that we need to do it, which is support the people. At the same time, we don't know how to do it except for increasing the national debt. So this is a paradox. Um, it is not an easy uh, decision. Uh, for me, I will say the priority will go to citizens. I don't want to see people uh, starving, uh, which we have seen uh, really, I think, uh, from March um, to the stimulus check to the first one. We've seen people starving. I don't mean starving by like a, really like literally starving. I, I mean that they didn't have the ability to secure food for themselves. Uh, you've seen photos of uh, miles of people uh, waiting in lines for the food banks. This is dangerous. So uh, this is what I don't want to see. So if 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 all if the only option that we have is to increase the national debt just temporarily to, to get over this, then we should do it. But the thing is, the stimulus bill was not about citizens. I think you know that. 4.5 trillions uh, of that stimulus package, which is about 6 trillions. So 4.5 trillions of that stimulus package that was passed um, went to corporations as uh, a gift, a giveaway, and only crumbs for the people. What does that tell you? It is not about the people. Um, they can secure uh, what the people need, but it was a bailout for the uh, economic uh, downturn, which happens every uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, um, according to the monetary system that we have built and tolerated. So anyhow, um, this is a problem that we need to address. Uh, yes, um, the COVID uh, measures and events really pushed um, that economic downturn, but it was inevitable. Um, uh, something that most people don't know that uh, last October and September, um, the government injected two trillions into the market from our tax dollars, but uh, they have not announced it to the people. I, I mean, the media didn't pick it up. Uh, they didn't talk about it. What does that mean? But they did it anyway. Um, so when you look at the stock market and you could see it is really doing good, it's not because they are doing good on their own, because we injected money. We started injecting money from last September. Uh, which is one of the um, cons of having centralized economy because uh, only a few corporations, I mean like a few hundreds of corporations really can collapse the whole country. And sometimes you need to support it. Otherwise it will collapse and all of the jobs that you have, uh, all of the economy, the liquidity of the economy will be gone unless you do it. So unless we change that system to localize the economy, which is one of the biggest issues I'm running um, to advocate for, which is localizing the economy, produce that centralized power, um, give the people security, economic security, which will reflect in different securities, including food security, uh, you know, homelessness, um, really started when we uh, entertained that idea 
uh, of centralizing the economy. This is one of them. I'm talking about homelessness. It is one of the uh, consequences of it. We can imagine, we, talk, we can talk about more of it. Who are you and what office are you running for? Uh, my name is Gary Dye and I'm a, a libertarian and I'm running for the United States Senate. Okay. Why do you want to run for this position? Um, I have run for state representative uh, four years ago, and I ran against uh, Earl Blumenauer, uh, District 3 U.S. Congress. Um, and so I'm sort of like stepping up, and um, I just see the problems in our country as being so severe. I'm very worried about an economic collapse coming very soon and what kind of society that would turn us into. And so I, I need to get into the Senate, uh, United States Senate. Um, I would uh, like to win the presidency, but <laughs> first things first. <laughs> no, I, I really see some horrible, horrible problems. I, I have an MBA degree and so um, I have a, decent knowledge of economics and I follow what's going on in the Fed and our debt and our money printing and it's just a terrible thing that's going on and we are on the edge of the bondholders who are keeping our government afloat you know we before the coronavirus we had a trillion dollar deficit Trump ran it up from about 450 billion a year to 1 trillion a year and our debt is, was 23 trillion before the coronavirus. I think we've added a few trillion to that. Um, but what people really don't know is that the Fed has been printing money like crazy in the background. Now that was supposed to thing that saves our bonds when the government basically has to default on our bonds. Um, our money supply has gone from $9 trillion about 10 years ago up to over $16 trillion before the coronavirus. You can only take so much of that until you destroy your currency. And that puts us into an incredible Great Depression. I'm very fearful of that happening. What is the biggest need you see in the state right now? Well, again, um, what has happened over the last hundred years or more is the government, both the Democrats and the Republicans, have basically cooperated into building government bigger and bigger and bigger and taking away more and more of our individual freedoms, both on the social side and also on the economic side. And um, it's coming to the point where, you know, we're, we're just all puppets of the government. And I've been, I've been making the claim that basically government has become a religion. Government has become our God. I don't know what you would call an entity that says it has a higher moral standard than the individual. And I can say that that's what's going on because our government is taxing us by force. Our government is saying, here's how much you're going to donate to society. I know how much that is, and I'm going to take it from you. And besides that, um, these taxes, which is going out to the society and the public, um, the government is deciding who deserves those taxes and basically that charity. It's not up to the individual anymore. The government says that it has a higher moral authority on where to divert your money um, than you do. What kind of entity does that? That's what a god is. Okay, and 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 and, it, and it's 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 just so totally out of control, and it's going to get worse. Um, I have a big fear that once we have this Great Depression, and I see no signs of it not happening. Nobody is getting in there and saying, we have to control our budget and our deficit and our debt and our money printing. And it's gonna break at some point. 
not exactly sure when it's going to be, but I'm surprised it hasn't already happened. And, and especially with this coronavirus shutting down the economy, what do you think our deficit is going to be after all these businesses are shut down and not going to start back up again? And it causes other businesses to uh, go into, you know, basically a recession and lay more people off. That snowballs into a, a recession and a great recession and a depression. And we're not in the same place we were 12 years ago when we didn't have this extraordinary level of debt and we didn't have this extraordinary level of money in the money supply. We will not be able to stimulate ourselves out of the next recession. That's gonna cause a hyperinflation event and crash the whole economy. We are really on the verge of an economic catastrophe. I think you've already answered the question I was going to ask next, but that's okay. You can expand on that. The, the question is, you know, with the ever-growing national debt, do we do you see a need to spur the economy further with a big stimulus package? I think I know the answer. Well, guess what Donald Trump has done, right? I mean, th uh, there is a reason and there's an excuse for what President Obama did 10, 12 years ago, right? I mean the economy was in a real recession, you know, caused by financial problems in, in, the, in the home uh, mortgage market, you know, and that just kind of like spread like a virus, uh, so to speak. Um, oh. But at that time, there was not that much national debt as a percentage of the G GDP, and the money supply just wasn't all that big. So he put out trillion dollar deficits for like three years, and then he worked it down when the economy started picking up. Now, you, you, you can't really argue that stimulus is a good short-term effect on the economy to get people spending, to get people confident again, again you know, and don't hunker down. Uh, you can argue that what are the long-term effects of that? Okay, fine. But you don't stimulate the economy when the economy is going well. And Trump took the deficit from about $450 billion a year all the way up to over a trillion dollars a year before the coronavirus. So now, if we have, what do you mean stimulate the economy? We already did it before the coronavirus. We were already at a trillion dollars a year deficit. And now a few trillion dollars uh, is going into the coronavirus relief and all that kind of thing, you know, and, and, and now stimulate it more. What you're really saying when you stimulate, when you say stimulate the economy is print money. That's what the Fed is doing right now. And you don't hear about that. And the reason you don't hear about that is because everyone knows about the national debt. You really can't hide that. But what everybody is saying is, oh, you don't have to worry about that because the government can always pay it off because they can print money. Well, they're already printing money. Printing money is the emergency procedure that you would do if the bondholders say, I am not going to buy those treasury bonds. I don't think, I think the government might default on them in 20 years, so I don't think I'm going to get my money back. And secondly, all of these interest payments in the meantime on those bonds they would buy. Well, if you've got hyperinflation, those interest payments aren't going to be worth much in real terms. That's what causes bondholders to say, no, I don't think I'm going to buy these bonds. So what does the government do? The government has to raise the interest rates, rates to entice the bondholders to buy these bonds. And whenever you see a government like Greece 10 years ago um, start playing this game of higher and higher interest rates to get people to buy these bonds because people have less and less confidence in them being paid off, um, it causes a snowballing effect until maybe you get to about 15 or 16% interest rates on these bonds. And then bondholders say, I'm not going to buy a bond no matter what. And they do not buy those bonds. So then what does the government do to pay off all their workers and all these projects? Currently our na national budget is four and a half trillion dollars. What happens? Well, what happens is that the government then starts printing money and it's not printing machines, right? They press a button that creates, that creates dollars and they send that to banks and, and, and whatever. That's how you throw 
money, dollars into the economy. So that's a last gasp effort to basically not have a default. But then what you're doing is printing money. And if printing money is a great thing that has never, never causes any kind of problems at all, then why doesn't the government solve our poverty problem by printing a million dollars and putting on it on everybody's doorstep? Wouldn't people not be poor anymore if the government did that? And they don't even have to do it with dollars. They can press a button and send it to their bank account, their checking account. Why doesn't government do that? Well, we know why. When you flood the economy with dollars, it creates inflation and then hyperinflation. But that's what's going on right now. The government is printing an incredible amount of money on top of the incredible amount of debt. This economy is going to crash. How do you think that's going to affect your city, counties, and state? Cool. You think Oregon is going to be able to escape that by doing things in the state government or even a city council? No. Okay. And final question. How would you deal with a situation, if you're elected, where you have one view on a situation and the populace of the state feels differently? Well, you guys, uh, that's the difference between, for example, an, a libertarian candidate and a Democrat or Republican candidate. The Republicans and Democrats, basically, there's nothing attached to their party label. What, what does Republican believe in? Well, I guess they believe in republics. What does a Democratic Party member believe in? Well, I guess they believe in democracy. What else? Well, what has happened, of course, is people with a liberal mindset have, you know, flocked to the Democratic Party and people with a conservative mindset have flat flocked to the Republican Party. Now, I'm a libertarian and libertarians have a libertarian political philosophy. It's right in our name. And basically, it's about freedom of the individual and no individual has the right to use force on another individual. And that includes the government. So... What I'm doing right now is I am stating my principles. I am not catering my message to what I think the people out there believe. What I want them to do is hear my message and believe in the principles that I stand for. So if I should happen to win this election, well, that will mean that the people actually believe in what I believe in. And so I'm going to do the things that I have promised to do uh, running for this office. So I, this is the very frustrating part. What it really means is uh, I realize that everybody out there has pretty much been voting for Democrats and Republicans. Well, how do I get them to vote for libertarians and me? Well, it's to get my message out there, but it's not getting out there because every media source, almost 100% is completely ignoring any third party candidate. The people are only going to be hearing about Democrats and Republicans and their solutions. And you, you can see by, you know, my voters pamphlet statement or, or my website and everything, um, I have completely different solutions to the problems that we have in our country. And of course, I believe that they're going to work, right? Why would I be doing this? Why would I be running into the Libertarian Party as a, as a candidate? Do I do it to enrich myself? because I'm going to get in office and I'm going to make a lot of money and make some deals and have my kids uh, get put on foreign boards of directors. So they make millions upon millions of dollars. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to get them to believe in what I believe so that we can save this country and not have an economic catastrophe. And when that happens, do you think the people are going to be turning to libertarians at that time? Do you think they're going to be betraying the Democrats and Republicans at that time and coming to libertarians? No, they're not. They will turn to a totalitarian who's going to make these promises that government is really going to take care of these things and the government is going to clamp down and we will no longer have any aspect of a free market economy and we will not have any kind of social freedoms that this totalitarian government does not believe in. And one thing that a totalitarian government believes in is that they are your God. And they will tell you that you need to give up your God because 
A totalitarian God does not like rivals. So we will be under a totalitarian regime when this economy crashes. And I am so fearful of that. And it's not really about myself. I'm not fearful about myself and how it's gonna affect me in my life. I'm basically retired. And I can tell you why I'm retired. It's, it's a horrible story. But I've got two kids. My daughter just turned 13 a couple days ago and my son is 14. And they're gonna be entering this world. And I see an absolutely horrible world in front of them if we keep going the way we're going. And it's not a Democrat or a Republican or a liberal or a conservative that's gonna save this country by changing the way we're going. It has to be someone else. And that someone else is a libertarian who believes in individual freedom. Who are you and what position are you running for? Well, my name is Bill Hansel, and I'm running uh, for re-election to the Senate position, District 29 in the Oregon Senate. It comprises, uh, my district has uh, six and a half counties. I have part of Wasco County, and then all of, starting at the Idaho border, Wallowa, Union, Umatilla, Morrow, Gillum, and Sherman counties. Yeah, uh, might find it interesting. It's the size of the state of Maryland third largest uh, geographical area in uh, district in the state. But why do you want to run for this position? Well, I've always had a compassion for public service. Uh, prior to uh, being in the Oregon Senate, I was privileged to serve as a Umatilla County Commissioner. I was um, uh, stood for eight elections. I served there for 30 years. And um, it, it just, uh, I guess my heart passion is to want to help people. And I've kind of chosen and um, I've been fortunate uh, that the people have allowed me to do that, uh, be involved in the political world of helping, to, trying to make government work for people and, and meeting their needs. So with uh, two years, uh, two uh, terms I've had in the Oregon legislature, my uh, total experience in the public sector elected office, uh, including the county commissioner, is uh, 38 years. What's the biggest need you feel currently in your district? Well, I think um, for sure it has to do with various aspects of uh, the natural resources. Um, we are um, the number one ag producing Senate district in the state of Oregon. There's 30 of them. Uh, and if you add up all the ag gate dollars and the impact on the economy that our agriculture brings to the table, uh, it's huge. And uh, we're the number one ag producing district in the state of Oregon. <clears throat> so whether it's cattle or agriculture, irrigation, water, fisheries, timber, uh, all of these and many more are a part of the fabric, our economic fabric of our county. And we're finding that as more and more people uh, grow up away from food production and not contact with agriculture like farms or uh, rural communities, they lose touch with what it takes to raise crops and feed people and uh, or provide timber for housing or whatever it might be. So one of the big needs and one of the things that I have found that uh, becomes a, an ongoing issue for those of us that represent rural Oregon uh, is to make sure our voices are heard, that we are a part of any type of resource allocation and that we uh, battle those types of policies that would actually harm or reduce or create issues for our production, uh, whether it be forestry, agriculture, uh, things such as that. So uh, the biggest need is to make our needs known and to defend them so that uh, policies aren't made in Salem that actually would be detrimental, uh, unnecessarily detrimental to our, our egg production base of our district. Obviously, the Oregon Department of Employment's uh, performance has been less than stellar. What needs to happen now? 
Well, first of all, uh, what should have happened before was to bring come into the current century with their um, uh, computer programs. Um, it's just uh, inexcusable for having, you know, before my time in the Senate, actually back in the 2009, I think it was, they were authorized to upgrade their computer system. And that has, as I speak right now, has not been done. Consequently, when we had this type of emergency, and un unprecedented, uh, they couldn't handle it. Um, so uh, we need to get them up and running. Uh, I'm pleased that they're, they're catching up. I've been watching this pretty closely. Um, uh, the new director is doing the best he can, I think, and, uh, and I feel he, he's taking responsibility for it. You know, we're, we didn't do what we should have. We're trying to do better. We're working hard to do it. And uh, I know the individual uh, needs that have come my way as we've gone, you know, staff have worked on particular cases. Uh, they seem to be uh, moving much quicker than they did before, and we're getting some conclusion. But I think, uh, first and foremost, we've got to get the infrastructure uh, uh, into place. It's going to take a while, but we've got, to, we've got to do that because if we don't, we're just right back where we've been. And the, the type of uh, <clears throat> electronic and computer uh, processing that has to come in, uh, we'll, you know, when we have that, I think we will be uh, where we need to be. <clears throat> How would you deal with a situation where your constituents are on one side of the issue and you're on the other? It kind of depends on what the issue is, uh, and I take it uh, issue by issue. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say 90%, 95% as I'm thinking back, uh, I would be where my constituents are, um, the majority of them anyway. There's always be those that uh, uh, don't agree with you. My wife and I don't agree on everything all the time. So it's just part of human nature. But for the most part, I think I'm a good fit for the, for the district. Uh, I come from a rural background. I was raised on a wheat and cattle ranch. So agriculture, production, uh, all of that uh, uh, type of uh, economic development is very near and dear to my heart. And I've, I've experienced it. Uh, I kind of use, generally speaking, uh, if need be, the three C's uh, of decision making for me personally. The first is my conscience. Um, uh, I will uh, vote and uh, participate on what I feel is morally correct and morally right, uh, my conscience. Uh, and uh, if that means I'm in disagreement with the majority of my, my constituents, um, they'll know where I stand and why I stand on it. The second uh, C would be my constituents. I reach out on many, many bills. I also uh, take uh, requests and uh, a lot of the bills I um, am able to uh, uh, work through this uh, system actually came from constituents calling me or saying, what about this or what about that? Can we do this? Um, one of the big ones that I was particularly excited about was the protection of the con correction officers. Uh, they would, when they were uh, exposed to inmate body fluids, either through blood or spittle or having urine thrown in their face or whatever, which unfortunately is uh, fairly uh, regular experience, not every day, but more common than most people would suspect, uh, they could not find out if the inmate had any type of, uh, was carrying any disease, uh, particularly hepatitis, but could be AIDS, that uh, they should be, you know, they may have been exposed to. Uh, we were able to get a bill through when the correction officers at EOCI and Pendleton uh, talked to me uh, prior to the session, a couple of sessions ago, whereby they could, because they could eventually find out, but with the HIPAA rules, it took so long to find out that by that time, if they had been exposed, it had the incubation period, they would have contracted the disease. So we needed to have it more timely where they could uh, find out and begin the treatment if they needed it. And that was, uh, we, we worked it through, uh, got good uh, uh, bipartisan support. And now we have a program where all the correction officers 
uh, are able, there's a procedure that they can find out quickly if they've been exposed and then they can begin their treatment. Otherwise they had to take a cocktail of everything and be, many of them became very, very ill and would even be out for a month or so. I say this as an illustration, that came from constituents. And uh, as soon as we hear different bills like that uh, needs, uh, we are, uh, we're on it. We're trying to get the legislation needed to do that. Another quick bill that was in the Sherman County, Wasco County area session before last, uh, or last uh, the last long session, as a result of the substation fire that uh, started in Wasco County and, and uh, went into uh, Sherman County, we began to see that under today's litigation, litigious uh, climate, we needed to protect the farmers who responded to the fire. And in fact, I think the argument could be made a couple of communities were actually saved by the timely uh, um, interaction uh, of farmers. They knew where the fire was coming, how it was going to get there, and they, Grass Valley and, and perhaps Morrill uh, were saved from you know, the Paradise, California uh, situation. So we began to work and I worked with the uh, um, trial lawyers to get a bill for uh, immunity for the farmers that if they responded in good faith and maybe, but maybe the fire got away from them or something else happened, hang on here, I gotta put my phone on mute, which I should have done before, sorry. Uh, but if they would uh, not be held liable if they acted in good faith. And so they'll be able to continue to respond to uh, uh, range land or, and or crop fires as they've done for a hundred plus years. Uh, so it's that type of constituent type bill that uh, I enjoy working on and, and uh, seeing put into law. And the third C? Pardon me? You said you, said you had three Cs. Oh, my third C, I'm sorry. <laughs> it would be the caucus. So it's constituent, I'm sorry, it's conscience, constituency and caucus. Um, you know, there sometimes we'll, we'll meet and uh, the, my fellow Republican senators are, you know, trying to figure out if, you know, we, uh, if we support this bill, you know, there's some negotiations going on and whatnot. And, uh, but they're not my first priority. My first, you know, I want to follow my conscience, what I believe to be right. Uh, and then my constituents. And there have been times I've gone against the caucus because it wasn't, I didn't feel it was good for my constituency. And uh, so those are the three C's that I kind of have in the back of my mind as I progress through the, um, where I'm going to stand on a given bill. The other thing I always have done uh, from the, my first days as a Umatilla County Commissioner is that I, the one thing I feel that I owe to all my constituents is why I voted the way I did. Uh, <clears throat> they may not agree with me, uh, and I, I respect that, but they need to know why it was I made that decision. So I, I think through, I, I try to um, uh, enunciate and, and know where I am on a bill and why I'm there and explain that to, uh, you know, to the people. And I think uh, more often than not, if they're in disagreement, at least they understand. And it's been my experience that they have uh, respected that particular position, may not agreed with it, but at least respected. And I, you know, there are people in the building that just vote no, just because, or for the, in spite of it, or to get even, or I try not to do that. I wanna have a clear cut reason why I, I voted the way I did and be able to uh, express that to others. So who are you and what position are you running for? Uh, first of all, thank you for allowing me to uh, be here today. It's kind of a different world, world we're in doing it remotely. My name is Representative Greg Smith. Uh, I'm seeking the seat for District 57 in the Oregon House of Representatives. Uh, just as a little bit of background, I'm married to a beautiful lady named Sherry. I have five children, four boys, and our youngest is a daughter, uh, two chocolate labs and a uh, cat named Kevin. 
and uh, live in Hepner, Oregon, and have served in the Oregon legislature for uh, for almost well over 20 years now. And so I serve as a senior member of the Oregon House of Representatives. So why do you want to run for this position? You know, uh, the reason I'm running today is the same reason I ran 20 years ago. It's an absolute honor to serve my neighbors in uh, North Central Oregon. There's nothing in the world like being able to step up and help a small business owner get through a bureaucratic issue that's no fault of their own, or to help a senior citizen get through an issue perhaps with health care, or to help a mom as she's trying to figure out how to make sure her kid gets enrolled in a school in a timely manner and figuring out how to get them back in the classroom. And so when it all comes down to a service, um, I feel like I still have a, a few more uh, uh, ounces of energy in me to serve after 20 years, and I'm hoping to get elected one more time. What's the biggest need you feel in your district right now? Yeah, you know, thank you for that question. For, for the last 20 years, I've really tried to focus on economic development and job creation, believing that the private sector, if we create good family wage jobs, will generate tax income that can help fund our schools and our hospitals and our public services. Um, but I have to share with you, um, my priorities are starting to shift. Um, I'm really believing now that mental health and addiction services and making sure those folks who need assistance um, receive it. Uh, when I talk with our law enforcement officials, whether it's our sheriffs or chiefs of police or the state police, they really share with me from the Dells all the way to Milton Freewater that we have a mental health crisis. And so in this next session, I really wanna focus on mental health. And then with that uh, follows housing. How do we make sure that we have adequate housing for all Oregonians, uh, particularly our middle-class Oregonians who are ready to step up and buy their first home. And so uh, mental health and uh, housing are really gonna be a focus of mine in the upcoming session. It's no secret that the uh, performance of the Oregon Employment Bureau has been less than stellar. What needs to be done there? Yeah, so I, I serve as vice chair of the Joint Committee on Ways and Means that oversees the $86 billion budget of the state of Oregon. And for those of us who have served in the legislature for a number of years, we knew this day was coming. We continued to warn the executive branch that they need to be ready for these crises. And so part of what we have to do is really step back, be honest with ourselves that the legislature and the executive branch have dropped the ball and now we have to step up and fix it. And what that means is we need to go in, make sure that our outdated, antiquated um, computer systems come into the next century. And so in the past, the legislature allocated those dollars, but they were never spent appropriately. And uh, in this upcoming value, any asking tough questions, I serve on the audit committee. We're going to be asking for an audit of the employment department, and we're going to be holding them accountable. The reality is Oregonians have suffered because the Oregon employment department wasn't ready for the crisis at hand. But I do want to be clear, they were warned. So no, the reality is we now uh, step back. We look at what the solutions going to be and then we hold that department account to make those necessary investments to make sure that the next time this occurs those dollars get out the door and how do you deal with this where your constituents believe one thing and you believe another on a particular issue you know that's an excellent question that's something i've had to deal with for 20 years so much of what goes on in the legislature really is not a personal belief it's a management issue and those legislators that can work together to solve problems find themselves being effective. You know, I would chide myself on being bipartisan. Um, in the past, I've been appointed by uh, the Speaker of the House to chairmanship, which is very rare when you have the majority party giving a gavel to a minority member, uh, especially on budget committee. And so the number one thing I'd share with you is bipartisanship and working together is the way I work through issues. 
Now, with that said, there's core beliefs. And those core beliefs, you simply cannot compromise on. For me, I'll give you an example. The Second Amendment is a core issue. I, I fundamentally believe our folks have a right to uh, carry and bear arms. And I will never compromise on that. The First Amendment, the right to speak uh, uh, freely, I believe is a fundamental right. And I'll never compromise on that. And so what I've learned in the legislature, is so many of the issues really come down to working together, but every once in a while, you have to stand up and say what you'll stand for, and sometimes more importantly, what you won't stand for. So who are you and what position are you running for? Good evening, Roger, thanks for having me. Um, so I am Daniel Bonham, uh, House District 59. I represent uh, currently half of Wasco County, all of Jefferson, Wheeler, and then northern Deschutes County down Sisters out to Black Butte. And of course, the entire lands of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs are in the district as well. So wonderful having the opportunity to serve as a state rep and also represent a sovereign nation. It, it uh, brings many interesting aspects to this job. And uh, so my wife and I, my wife Lori, who's from the Dalles, this is home for her. Uh, we moved back in 2007 and bought a small business, and we've raised our children here. Our, our two kids, Jennifer and Jack, now are, well, Jennifer's done with college now, believe it or not, and, and Jack is a sophomore in college, and so we're, we're at this next phase of life where they're, like, interested in members of the opposite sex, and, and you know, we're talking about, you know, potential mates, and so this was something I personally wasn't ready for. <laughs> Uh, but uh, here we are, and, and we're moving forward anyway. So why do you want to run again for this position? You know, I grew up in Oregon, and, and I just told you, you know, about my family. Oregon's given me everything, yeah, from my wife that was born here, my kids were born here, uh, I've made a living here. I, I was raised in the public school system in Tigard, and I uh, got a quality education here, went to Linfield College. So Oregon has given me everything I have. And, and so my goal with serving in this office is to give back. You know, how do I make sure that the next generation of Oregonians has the same opportunities that I had? How do I make sure that they have access to quality education? How do I make sure that the jobs are there when they graduate so that they can stay in this state and raise their families here? We have such a beautiful state. Arguably, I'll say that House District 59 is the most beautiful part of the state. We've got. Uh, the Sisters, we've got uh, Mount Jefferson, we've got the Deschutes River Valley all the way up to the Columbia Gorge. It is a beautiful place to call home. And uh, I just wanna, I wanna keep that for generations to come. So what's the biggest need you feel that exists in the district right now and what you hope to accomplish about that? You know, I think right now the biggest need is balance in the state. I think that, you know, it's more of a political answer than probably what you were going for. but. The reality is, uh, in the last 10 years, we've, we've moved to the point where the legislature is now controlled by super majorities. And when one party has that much power, there's not a lot of negotiation, there's not a lot of compromise, and they start to legislate in a vacuum. They talk within their own bubble, within their own circle, and they don't necessarily engage with people that have a different perspective to consider whether or not their answer is the right answer across all of the state. And, and as you can imagine, the more rural parts of Oregon are represented by members of the minority party. And so that voice right now is somewhat muffled and stifled in, in Salem. And so the goal is to restore balance to Salem, which should bring about a few things. Uh, more transparency in the government process. Right now there's a lot of deals happening behind closed doors, uh, in back rooms, uh, smaller groups of, of the upper echelon of leadership just getting together and, and making decisions. Uh, so transparency is big. And then with more transparency and public input, which is the second part, it leads to more accountability, which is the final thing that we're trying to get through uh, restoring some balance in the, in the legislature. You know, it's pretty clear that the uh, Department of um, Employment uh, has been a disaster. What can and should we be doing about that? I think first and foremost, the money that we got years ago, it was originally $89 million that the federal government gave the state of Oregon to update our, our system, to bring it into alignment with other uh, software that we have throughout the state, uh, allowing better accessibility, 
allowing for better transaction and information flow. And so getting that project finally to bid and then implemented, uh, we've spent millions of dollars so far just getting it to bid. And we've put it out to bid multiple times now without actually awarding or moving forward with the project. So I think that's the big challenge right now is to absolutely update that system and then to continue to manage the number of employees to, to case ratio so that we can have proper time frames for response and, and getting people through. We still have almost 40,000 people that are waiting for payment. And so many that have received partial payments beyond those 40,000, you know, they may have claimed 21 weeks of unemployment and received four weeks payment. And, and that's just not any way for people to, to get by through these trying times. So how do you handle a situation when the district believes one thing politically and you believe something different? You know, that is, that is the question of all questions, right? And, and so I've had many people tell me, we elected you for your discernment, for your wisdom, and yet I push back and say, but my job is to re represent the voice of the district. And so I think it is the challenge for every elected official to, to discover that balance and to work with that balance. But the reality is, if I'm not doing what the district wants me to do, they won't send me back. And so are there times where you know, I've been engaged with meetings at the Capitol that people haven't had a chance to, to witness that testimony or, or be exposed to some of the information that I've had? Uh, yeah, that's happened, right? And then I'll tell you, for me, that's when I get on the phone and I start calling people back home saying, I've heard that you disagree. Are you aware of this, that, and the other? And to the extent that they are, sometimes it changes my perspective. And, and other times they say, well, no, I didn't know that. Had I known that, maybe I would have supported that bill. And so, um, you know, I, th I don't have the best answer, but I, I think the, the true uh, nature of this job is, is to represent the people and to do what they want and not necessarily what you personally, individually want. I think that's, that's where I would tend to default. Who are you and what office are you running for? I'm Arlene Burns. I'm currently the third term mayor of Mosier and I'm running for Oregon House District 59. Okay. I've been here in Mosier since 1993. Uh, I'm originally from South Carolina, and I took a bit of a long turn to get here. I was overseas for about 13 years, mostly in New Zealand and Nepal, and then working pretty much all over the world as an international guide and a photojournalist. And then I got involved in filmmaking and I've been producing and directing film festivals and films of mostly documentaries um, for the last 20, 20 ish years. So um, I was first on city council and then I became city council president. And then in, I think 2014, I was elected mayor. So what do you want to run for this office? Well, why I want to run for this office is um, actually because I was a little frustrated having gone to Salem for the last uh, several years, first with uh, oil train safety issues and also trying to raise money for our project in Mosier, which is a, which is a net zero fire hall, city hall and community center. And um, everything kind of ground to a halt two years in a row. And I felt so frustrated because there were so many things in motion that then nothing happened. And I, I just started feeling like so many people's effort and energy went to nothing with our representative walking away. And um, that's why I'm running, because I think we need to stay at the table and to represent this district, you need to stay at the table and find solutions and work across the aisle in an effective way. So that's why I'm running. What do you think is the biggest problem facing the district currently? And what would you do to deal with that? Well, I think that there are lots of things uh, collectively facing the district and, and they all have to do with um, how we are going to recover from our health crisis, from our climate crisis, which you know, has been um, exaggerated by the fires lately, and also our water crisis and water management. So my whole platform or idea is about resiliency. How do we do things in a different manner that give us economic resilience, agricultural resilience, and, um, and also health resilience? 
Um, so those are the things I really want to focus on. Okay. It's pretty obvious that the Oregon Department of Employment has uh, been less than stellar in its performance. What does the state legislature need to do? For the Oregon Department of Employment, um, well, I think the best way for us to um, have uh, invigorate our economy is to first of all start with training in new technology and then implementation of infrastructure such as broadband to everyone in our district so they can participate in education and also work remotely in these kinds of times of crisis like COVID. And um, this will uh, give good paying jobs and long term jobs and will also enable us to recover um, from some of our conditions brought about by the climate crisis. And finally, what would you do in a situation where you believed one thing, but the district believes something else? Well, I would listen is the first thing. And I, I'm sure that there are things I believe in that some people in the district might not. But I think um, if we focus on what we have in common and um, what is the innate core that we go from, from just this is like, let's focus on what we share, what we love, what we have in common. And, and I think from there, we can find ways to work together. So of course, it's actually really healthy if people have different perspectives, but it's a matter of staying at the table and listening to those and finding solutions that work for everybody. Who are you and what position are you running for? Well, my name is Lynn Finley. Uh, I'm running for the State Senate for Senate District 30. Senate District 30 encompasses uh, a majority of Wasco, Jefferson, Northern Deschutes, Wheeler, Grant, Harney, Baker, and Malheur in the eastern part of Lake County. Roughly 36% of the state landmass is Senate District 30. And why do you want to run for the office? Well, I was appointed to the office. I, I, ser I was serving in the House of Representatives for Senate for House District 60. Uh, when then Senator Bentz resigned to run for Congressional District 2, uh, I was appointed to the fill out the remainder of his term, which goes through the balance of this year. I, I spent my most of my professional career in public service. I fought fire for the federal government for 32 years, fought fire in, in every state west of the Mississippi River and a few states on the other side of it. Uh, and after I retired from my firefighting career, I, I served as a member of the County Planning Commission. I became city manager and I worked on the issues for the city of Vale, providing water and wastewater services uh, and infrastructure for growth. Uh, so I believe in, in giving back to the communities. I believe in public service. <clears throat> when the opportunity came to, for uh, a spot in the Oregon State Legislature, I took that because I believe that people of Eastern Oregon, people of rural Oregon need to have a strong advocate for issues going on that affect their life daily. And one thing that the legislature does is impact every Oregonian's life almost every day. And I, ensure, I want to ensure that, that our voices are heard. So. Okay. What's the biggest need you feel in the district and what do you plan to do about it? Well, <clears throat> it's a great question. Uh, the problem with it is that the district is 36% of the state. It's a huge landmass. And there are different issues throughout, from natural resources to, to agriculture, to water usage, to tourism, to transportation issues. So it's a, it's a tough thing to put your finger on. There's a few overriding areas. Economic development, job retention, job growth are major issues. Coupled in with those is housing, affordable housing, uh, and the, the, all the issues that, that, that are limiting our ability to grow, land use stuff. Uh, then I don't know if you've been between the Dalles and been to lately, but Highway 97 is not a lot of fun to drive on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, so you got transportation 
And then you have infrastructure issues. I mean, there's huge infrastructure issues. I mean, we were able to find some some funding to help Warm Springs Indian Reservation, you know, about $8 million for their infrastructure things this spring. But they're not the only, only area that's got infrastructure problems. I mean, from Baker City, we've got some water issues, they're drilling a well to, to small rural communities all over the state. So it's a wide range of areas that need help. And as much as anything, <clears throat> we need to ensure that our rural way of life is protected. Uh, quite frankly, we make a lot of decisions in the state capitol with not full review of the unintended consequences of those decisions. So I, I want to ensure that there's an analysis done on those decisions on how it affects rural Oregonians to find our way of life uh, and, and, and help us thrive and be, serve our own needs. So that was kind of a long question on, but any single issues? I, it's hard to say a single issue. I mean, what's more important? They're all very critical. And if it's affecting you, that's the most important thing there is at the time. So you got to be, be careful and recognize that. So. So, you know, my colleagues don't quite understand. I mean, when I drive to Salem, it takes me seven hours to get there. Uh, so I don't willingly go to Salem a lot. I go when I need to be there. But uh, so it's, they, they can't quite grasp the, the, the breadth of the state yet. So I try my best to educate them in that manner. Great. Uh, obviously the Oregon Department of Employment has uh, had a real rough time of it. What needs to be done now? Well, thank you for that question, Roger. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I believe, and, and I, I said that this is the biggest collapse of the state government that I've ever witnessed. And some of my colleagues reminded me a few other programs that were probably as significant as failure as that. So I have to say it's one of the top five. I mean, this is absolutely embarrassment. I mean, when, I've helped hundreds of people, my staff has helped hundreds of people get their benefits through no fault of their own, through have not been able to receive any unemployment benefits in 25 weeks. I mean, that's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, I, 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 I met with the Senate president uh, the first part of August and, and told him that we, the legislature have oversight responsibility and we're not doing it with the employment department. You know, to have tens of thousands of Oregonians not get those benefits is just unacceptable. And the Oregon, the employment department, the first few months of this pandemic, I agreed with them and said, well, this is unprecedented. But, but after they've hired 700 people, you know, six months into it, people still aren't getting their phones answered. They're, they're not getting responses. They have no idea where their claim is. It's a catastrophic failure of oversight management. And so they held at, at my urging, the Senate president agreed with me. He, he, he put together the Senate Business and Labor Committee. To, to, they did three, three days of hearings. They've continued to work on the matter. Uh, I, one of my colleagues in the Senate who served on that committee suggested that perhaps it's time to dismantle the organization department and rebuild it appropriately because it's absolutely not functioning. They received $88 million 10 years ago to upgrade their information technology system. And they've not done it. I mean, and they're all argument they couldn't provide these services this year because their IT system was bad. Well, you've had 10 years to fix it. You've had the money, but you haven't done it. You know, I, it's just, and, and, and but let me, let me state clearly that a lot of the workers for that department are doing the best they can. I mean, they absolutely are working hard. It's not their fault that they've got a lack of management. They've got a lack of direction and lack of support from the from this leadership of this state. How do you deal with a situation where your constituency believes one way about an issue and you believe another? Well, <clears throat> you know, I the classic example is cap and trade. You know, for the last two, two sessions, we have wrapped our axles around cap and trade. I've had constituents that in my district came in very passionate about their thoughts and beliefs uh, and on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the issue. So, you know, and I guess what I do is, is 
I absolutely support someone's ability and, dis- and thought process and to have that decision. If it's an informed decision, I'll support the heck out of it. There's times when it gets to the end and it just in the preponderance of people in my district supporting an issue, that's the way I'm going to go. I mean, and this is not my positions on issues. This is the people I support. You know, there's 135,000 people in my district and I support those folks. So we're not always going to agree that I'm not always going to like some of the positions, but if that's a majority of the, the, my constituents, then I support what they want. That's why I have, you know, we've had nine virtual town halls. We continue to have them every couple of weeks. I send out about 13,000 emails in a newsletter. I solicit input from folks because the decisions I make are based on their input, or based on the constituents that I represent. So. so who are you and what office are you running for? My name is Karina Miller and I am running for the Oregon State Senate in District 30. Okay. Why do you want to run for this position? I wanted to run for this position because my background is that I was a social worker for my tribe and an early educator. And I worked firsthand with children and families and just saw the need for an increase of services across the board. And then I was elected onto the Warm Springs Tribal Council where I really dove deep into policy work and saw a lot of opportunities specifically for Senate District 30. Um, And I knew my background, not only in working with families but also in policy and governance would make me a strong candidate, not just in the state of Oregon, but even in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. So what is the biggest concern or threat you feel for the district right now and the plans for that? I think um, my biggest concern, you know, I know that we would like to talk about the specific issues or bills we'd work on, but for me, the biggest concern is really information and the way that our um, representatives can communicate to district members about the way legislation can impact them. I think right now, a lot of us in this district actually agree a lot on the needs and the things that are impacting us, but because of a lot of division, we're not having those conversations with each other. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in true relationship building uh, because things like addiction, education, access to healthcare services, uh, natural resource economy, all these things are impacting every single person in this district. And we can all do something about it together, but we have to also deal with the things that are harmful in our communities like racism and sexism and all of the things that are hard to talk about. Um, So I think that's honestly the biggest issue facing us is that we need leadership who will unite us, who will bridge those gaps. And, and, you know, we haven't always um, prioritized that as a district. It's pretty obvious that uh, the uh, Department of Employment has been less than stellar in its performance. What do you think we need to do about it from the state perspective? I mean, I think this is another bigger picture when you look at Senate District 30, where again, my experience as a tribal council member for Warm Springs, you know, we were a timber tribe. Um, I come from a ranching family. My dad, when I was growing up, would take me into the woods as a baby and would fall trees and sell wood. So I really know firsthand the impacts of economy in this district, how it's taken a toll on the traditional forms of economy. And this is where you look at things like carbon markets and ways to expand our economy into other areas and to move forward, create more stability, more long-term economic job growth for local people in the community. That's what I hope to see. And finally, how do you deal with a situation where your belief on an issue is different from that of your district? You know, I think that my belief of issues, um, a lot more people do believe in those issues. And then as an indigenous woman, I really understand and recognize how public education has not only been used as a tool to wipe out native culture, to condition us to have certain beliefs and identities, but I recognize how that takes place throughout the entire district. So even though the makeup of the district might not reflect my views, the way that we register to vote and things, I have to believe in my heart that people know it is time for change and are going to choose to vote for somebody who grew up here, who has worked from the ground up, who truly cares about families, who people have existed here since time immemorial and understand that this isn't how Oregon always was. This is not how these lands always were and that we deserve a community where all people feel safe and welcome and are planned for and are cared for. And that's what I want to do. And I think, you know, because our reservation is in this district and because I am a mother now, the important thing for me is to just sit down and have those conversations. 
you know, it's um, winning this race. It's really not just about the seat. It's about the impacts that we can have people like me can have on each other. Cause I do believe in community. I do believe in neighbors. You know, I do believe that people truly care. And if we just keep pushing and hold on tight and keep having these conversations, these tough conversations that we can get somewhere real. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for watching our 2020 candidate forum. Uh, we hope that this was helpful. We hope it was informative and that it will give you some more information to better equip you to make that decision that is so important and the privilege of voting. So we wish the best to you. Have a great day and we will talk to you soon. And we like to again thank everyone who helped make this possible with the Dallas Area Chamber of Commerce.